Okay, hello, good morning, everybody. So we uh, start our second and, uh, well, probably last uh, official discussion about survey strategy this meeting. I'm sure this is not going to stop here. We are continued uh, conversation. Now, just before we actually go into full science uh, commissioning, but uh, during, as you know, that we have, you know, uh, as was presented before, we have some good news that uh, the whole situation with the technical aspects of the, the science drive uh, modules has been at least agreed with B2B. They're coming in January, the date due to be arranged, which should be the first half of January to uh, do a full fixing of the, the issue with the capacity here. Uh, science, you know, one of the modules already back in SAFTA, so everything is going to the direction that we will uh, start pretty soon with the full, fully operational focal point of the capital. So now the question of strategy becomes very important because uh, there are many factors into play here. Some of them have to do with our delay in starting the survey to make the old adjusted. Some of them have to do with the, the sites that we give more or less priorities, the areas they are covered, and what the choices do we have. So this document, uh, first of all, I have to apologize a little bit and thank uh, Ali for having started this. And I mean, really don't know if you have more stuff there, but if you have tears on the blue, um, or Sylvia. <laughs> um, so um, that's, that was the skeleton, things that we are assuming for the science verification that uh, we will very likely have the beginning one by one, you can say power 99%. I'm still optimistic that maybe the issue with, that is happening with the apparent blooming may be actually solved technically within some time. Then we'd have an option. We might actually continue with one by one, but then we'd have the option. Um, there is uh, um, actors um, talk. He talked about the unedited area. I'm sorry, there's a little, a little <laughs> bit of editing here. So um, we have the, the area has been slightly shorter because of this funny reflections that are happening. And, uh, the actors explaining detail here. And you saw the pictures, and you have to do a baffle to avoid this issue. Um, the readout mode. Um, I'm just looking at the chat in the but I'm assuming that it doesn't matter if you go fast, it's better to go fast because they don't matter from what you said before. Um, and the broadband only in detection band, it seems to be a general consensus that I is bad. <clears throat> so there's this, and again, I'm taking just from Alice's uh, talk. Uh, the available sky, remember that this was the Erosita, the ecliptic, this is the Milky Way, this, those were two seeds. Um, I'm going to skip this to the next one to two later because I, I will go back to this in a second. So there are, I just suggested this four um, priority levels. Um, so the seeds, uh, one and two tiers. Um, the third tier I don't even mention because it looks like sci-fi, because yeah. at some point we even ch change completely things and do some other survey at, uh, at some point in the future. Um, so uh, if um, the seed priority with the lowest air mass is observed, then the points around will actually get higher priority, which makes sense. So this is uh, one last change, and remember that uh, tiers uh, one and two, they can be modified, and Ali has been trying to say this uh, repeatedly, that it's not fixed, it's not settled completely the tiers there. You can shift a little bit, shrink, fatten, so that you can try to optimize the science that you get, especially in the first year. <coughs> this would be, sorry, something general, but especially in the first year, because it would be really good to have some very fast science in the very beginning. Um, so this uh, would include the, the NAP region, the NAJ pass region, ECTOMAP, I think is around here. If you, if you don't mind, um, I just want to comment one Please. thing about this. 
Um, this is not the same that I showed uh, on Monday um, because of the discussions that have been going on this week. Um, so, is this a map? Yeah. So, because of the discussions of this week, uh, the the northern part is very much still the same. So, these uh, two, the northernmost seeds now are still JNAP and um, mini J pass. And uh, and then I moved the slightly the southern uh, cap, the tire one on, in the southern cap, I moved it 10 degrees south solidly. Um, and uh, I moved this uh, seed to Stefan's quintet uh, because it's pretty. <laughs> Be and uh, because it's a quartet of three galaxies, <laughs> and uh, because it was on the Weave press release, uh, so it sounds like ideal place to have your first light. Um, can can it be moved further down? Yes. Can it be moved somewhere else? Of course. The there is one um, seed which I'm not particularly fond of. And it's this one, which I'm not fond of from a technical reason, because it's, you, if you know me, if you have spoken five minutes with me, you understand it. This is very close to the ecliptic. So there will be moments where this is not observable. And naturally, from what you saw in the previous slide, um, from here, the algorithm will look for something better to observe, which is probably going to be around here-ish. And, uh, and all of a sudden, this area starts to get not observed. There, so you may wonder, why are you so masochistic that you put a seed there? Um, I'm doing it because under this line, which is, I'm, I'm, I apologize for my mm -hmm. scheme, but this line is the is the border between Russia and German, Germany, right? So if, unless Putin decides that the border can move, he tends to do it. Um, um, the, it is uh, um, uh, this is a fairly good in terms of right ascension seed. Right again, because what Alberto was commenting the other day, you want the seeds to be separated from each other by 60, 80 degrees in right ascension. So this is best compromise between being close to the Milky Way, far from the Milky Way, up north. Okay. My famous 10 degrees. Can I move it 10 degrees east, west, up, south? I would hate it. North. I can't because I want to have it within the Erosita footprint. Mm. So here goes the, the question of the people who deal with uh, Erosita, Germany, Russia, uh, whatever. Um, so yeah, so basically my question is, do we want to have a seed within the Erosita thing or not? If we don't, super happy, easy. There's plenty of other seeds there. So, sorry, just I uh, just wanted to clarify this. Mm -hmm. So I, I could say a few words about this, but I think that uh, the cluster folks are gonna uh, um, talk about this. Sylvia. Hi, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Ale, I was wondering one thing actually of something you said. So. I I I, very, I understand why this seed might not be optimal. What I didn't understand, you said that um, if this cannot be observable at some point, the the uh, you know the algorithm would search like higher higher declination, right? So I I somehow thought that the um, if one seed at some at a given point doesn't work, the algorithm would try to go close to the other seed. Yeah, Is that not? Hmm? So yeah. Right. Uh, so, but then not really just a fixed array, but just would move to the to the other seed. No. Uh, so, the, sorry. So, here's the so here's the thing. So, if uh, this seed, uh, we, this seed is a uh, 
We see this right now. So let me use mini J pass as an example. Uh -huh. okay. When uh, mini J pass sets, right? Because because the earth rotates, um, at some point it's not observable anymore. And therefore, what basically you are getting uh, here, and then at some point the algorithm will say, okay, so there's this other seed which has a better air mass, so I will jump and start observing here. Right. What happens with this? With this, it may happen that this is still up. This is not up yet. This is not up anymore. But there's the moon nearby here. Okay, so, so yeah. is that it's because the array is too low? So shall we add then a seed in between? There's a, so the, there's a two options here. One option would be to have another seed around here, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, and in that case, when uh, the moon gets close to this one, you just hop to this other one. Oh, sorry. You you hop to this other one, and you're safe, and you start observing something else. <clears throat> the other option is just to move this further away from the from the from the ecliptic. Um, the the reason there's a strategic reason. Um, uh, sorry, we don't want to use the word strategic. There is a there's a reason uh, why I try to have the smallest number of um, of seeds, and is the smaller the number of seeds, the larger the contiguous area that we observe is. So if uh, if we have uh, like now five seeds, we basically start covering five contiguous areas. So assume that we manage to observe 200, 300 square degrees contiguous in the 56 filters. At the end of the year, we get uh, five areas, 300 square degrees, just to make the number easy, each 60 square degrees in, 60, uh, in 56 filters, right? So otherwise you start having uh, seven, eight, smaller areas, which is, you know, again, uh, this was, yeah, I admit, this was my own imposition. I, um, I understood that um, less larger contiguous areas would be better than uh, uh, more smaller disconnected areas. So, and I still understand that it's better to have but I mean, adding S, S moving 10 degrees is no big deal. Adding one more region is no big, is no big tragedy, right? If one adds, I don't know, one seed around here ish. I don't know, just point. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's the infamous position at uh, 180 degrees, 40, um, 40 degrees, roughly. So that was a very funny position, right? So I don't want to get into much details before. I, I'm sure the cluster folks are going to talk about this, but I think that the uh, uh, impressions of the Eurozita coverage overlap will be mostly important uh, three years from now, perhaps two to three years from now, uh, because the depth is apparently not as good for the cluster folks as the spread all over XML pointings in terms of X rays. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, so it's still the deepest uh, um, all sky uh, X ray observation ever made. And it's deeper than uh, uh, HOSAT. Yes, but they yeah, have. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I mean, for, I they, mean I'm not speaking it's about not clusters. Just, uh, it's not J pass science. I mean, this is, you know. This, well, the, define J pass it's science. Not, it's not J pass science. The, <laughs> that, I mean, for, for stellar people, uh, I mean, for stellar people, the, this is phenomenal well, already. It will get better. Huh? It will get better. Yeah, I have it. can get better, <laughs> no, right? But they stop they have. They are not at the full depth. I know, I know. But it is already, okay. already now, and if uh, by whatever reason they decide to, you know, they will never switch on the, the instrument again, sure. this is already That's the a... deepest that has ever been. I know. My, my, my whole point is that the, the, this is not exactly as urgent as. Okay. Okay, that, that, that's that's an important. So, you reckon? Ah, Silvia Levantola Manoge. Sorry. Yeah. No, 
I was just wondering, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of I mean, this is still the, the deepest X-ray wide area observed. So, I, I mean, of course, I, again, it's all matter of priorities. I'm just wondering, Ale, um, because you have been mentioning also the other day that somehow you grow uh, from a seed, you generally grow left uh, um, left top, right? Going uh, um, somehow diagonally towards the, a higher array. So if if somehow in the north we have seeds that create a diagonal, I mean, uh, somehow it would be easy to connect the observations of all the seeds, right? Somehow you grow, uh, it's uh, not necessarily diagonal, it's more towards the left and towards 40 degrees. Right. So let's say if uh, from the first seed, which is in the Rosita, we start moving towards uh, 40 degrees and uh, 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 towards the left, possibly relatively quickly, we would connect anyway to a possible new seat, which it would be in between, right? That's correct. Okay. And, uh, Thanks. That is a seed which, in my, in my view, would, uh, would come out naturally. Naturally, okay, thank you. There was a position I was very fond of about 180 degrees in right ascension, and I can't remember if it was, I think it was about 40 degrees declination. Um, there was a, was a magical soft spot of other surface. Um, it was in is, one, one of, eh? Why is, why is it somewhere? I, I can't remember. I, 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 I remember at some point, I was putting things together and there was this magic spot. Or the glitter path. Eh? No, no, no. Uh, the North Ecliptic no, the North Ecliptic pole is uh, is uh, right here. arriba a la izquierda. Right. Yeah, no, the North Ecliptic. One hundred eighty. Okay. Yeah. No, the North the, the North Ecliptic pole is uh, is because it's the deepest uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, test observation. But the, there was that other position which was something where head dex was and uh, uh, all other. Oh, it would be good to have this, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. document, so we can have uh, I, I, I had it in a, okay. I, I can dig it out again. Yeah. But yeah, that, adding an extra, adding an extra seed there, that would be natural, which actually connects yeah. to something that I have, I think, on the next slide. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, yeah, the next slide, you put this basically you the same with some interesting... So, uh, the Kepler M87 M31. So what I am somewhat suggesting that there was, there was something that Carlinhos commented the other day and was, uh, at this point I come here, there was something that Carlinhos said the other day when, when we commented about Virgo and uh, I think we all agree that Virgo is, is a must and, and he said um, if as soon as we open open time, uh, we go for Virgo. So at this point, why not we take a series of point rings, which would be, which are naturally interesting. Don't say what you're going to say. <laughs> a series of point rings, which are naturally we interesting. We all know. <laughs> so uh, the Kepler field, M87, uh, M31. <laughs> And the uh, map, and we put those in open time. So let me put in a different way in this talk. Uh, open time is open time. Anyone uh -huh. can, can apply for it. Uh -huh. And there are many ideas here of people that can uh, get particular targets and therefore benefit the survey and apply competitively to open time. That's right. So that. Well, so, uh, just, 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 just let me finish this. <laughs> the advantage of this would be that, uh, nice, funny enough, these pointings are have uh, possibly are the most interesting places in the northern hemisphere from an astrophysical point of view, and uh, and they are at the borders of the na of our natural um, footprint. So. If we take care of this in uh, in open time, we relax the constraints on on uh, on the footprint. We can have a, a more an easier footprint for the northern part, easier footprint on the southern part. So it's 
from a main survey point of view, this is much more relaxing, much easier. And it maximizes the success of the observatory as a whole. Sure. So if, if, if out competes the other com, competing proposal. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Uh, around, yeah. I have a can I show something which I think it's uh it's related to that figure. You can share straight to the I can share straight yeah, right. through the and I log into Zoom. Yeah, sure. So what we wait um so if we put this in open time, what's I mean anybody it could be done by somebody outside the collaboration. That's correct. Yes, actually so, so they have a, so we have to wait to get the data for how long? For, for the open time? No, if somebody else yeah. puts a proposal to observe yeah. okay, and they get a nice field there, and yeah. we decide not to observe it as part of uh, the JPAS survey. Mm -hmm. We have to wait for that data, right? So it's like one year or something. That's right. Yeah. Or more, even Virgo, I don't know what the weather in March here, what do you say, Hector? It was very, very, very difficult. Uh, bro, because of the why, you, why you connect there? Because, because of the weather. Should we move? Uh, the the proposal at the time is one. Should we move a couple so. of slides while you're, you're waiting there? From, so, from whatever or is it related to that? Can I move a little bit while you're connecting? Can I keep going? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can, right. I can come back to this. It's related, but. Okay, I'll go back to the slide then. So this is the, just to remind you, just the configuration, the last one that Ali sent me, I think, of the, the one that Tony. Said before, I actually asked this because this is um, uh, one, two, three, four. And <clears throat> this is, I think it's important because there are some simulations that were done. I think uh, Siddhartha uh, uh, was doing some simulations about the, the detectability uh, with different number of filters. And he was using equal spacing. It might be perhaps more interesting to see how it would be if it was like for real. Get the, the ones that are not, are not equally spaced if you take one whole tray. So the simulations for that, I think they should be updated. Um, so it has been one of the things, yes, that we, we try to stress, and some people already did a good job on this. It's not just looking for what you, like, you think is the best for what your science is. Everybody knows what the best is. It is the crappy sandwich with some spices to enhance the flavor. Mm. So look for the spices, right? the hamon in the middle. And for example, <laughs> yeah. so uh, in, in, in this case here, Eduardo showed yesterday, a good compromise would be, for example, the ectomap, which is right in the, in the footprint. It can be very good for uh, calibration for lensing and, and uh, for the cluster science. And this um, uh, was added uh, to me. I, I, right. I, should I go here or can I go back to this? Just, just let me go super quick. Okay. Um, so, yes, well, between last night and this morning, because of the because of the lamb, uh, I woke up at half past five. Uh, <laughs> the lamb was not particularly happy around uh, around my stomach. Um, anyway, still there. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I was trying to. Um, to make some numbers with uh, survey growth. Uh -huh. So, um, without Euclid, um, so only having the I band, there's no worries. So without, so without Euclid now only having I band, um, one can Im imagine a scenario when um, I band grows, and you have the numbers down here. I band grows at uh, more than 1, 000, almost 1,400 square degrees a year. The the two bluest rays grow at uh, almost 1,000 square degrees a year. <coughs> the two reddest rays grow at 280 square degrees a year. So in, at the end of the day, effectively, this means. Um, the bluest trays having 900, almost 1,000 square degrees, and all sorry, all the all the filters 
for 200 square degrees a year. Uh, error bars can be up to 50% easily because, yeah. What time, I guess you're adopting Hector's numbers about photometric and non-photometric time and all these things? Uh, about. That I'm, instead of doing it per month, I'm just averaging over the year. Over the year. Mm -hmm. so this is a super back of the envelope kind of thing. I have some similar plots, which so it's a little more pessimistic than you. Eduardo. As I said, and error bar, the error bars that I'm estimating, this is based on a series of, um, on a series of assumptions, which easily sum up to some 50% error bars. Uh, Eduardo has a question. Who? Eduardo. Just. Can you just let me go through the next two things? Oh, oh, sorry. I think you just yeah. I know. Go on, go on. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead again. You're on speaker. Um, the other thing that one can imagine doing is to go with all the filters at the same speed, mm -hmm. right? So um, this was the first simulation that I did and I and I was going like, I, woohoo, uh, a tuta gallara and uh, the other ones a little bit, yeah, at a, at a decent speed. And uh, yeah, I, like this, I would have something like 600 square degrees a year. So what is that again? Um, I bend, uh, Okay. Um, going stupid and uh, everything else. All trays. So eh, all trays, uh -huh. they have six about six hundred square degrees a year. Mm -hmm. Of course, I can slow down. I bend and uh, make the the rest of the filters faster. Faster. So this, which is about yeah, we're talking about seven hundred square degrees. Well, uh, yeah. So that this will be a ballpark for everything. The, in so, this case, you would have a, about 700, 600 square degrees in all the filters. I have to confirm this. I, have, I want to recheck all the numbers. Hmm. Alberto, don't ask me yes, questions. No, no, it's, not, it's not, not even a question. Just a comment to just remember everyone that this would be the theoretically ideal situation where your camera covers homogeneously, let's say. Gotcha. In, in reality, those 650 would be a slightly larger area with borders where only part of the area is covered and, all, mm -hmm. and the smaller area with everything goes. Okay. Um, I think uh, Raul has... Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe you can ask, uh, uh, answer somebody's question there and then I can show a figure about exactly this um, topic that Ograt was raising now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe... Uh, Thank you. Can, can you can you log in? in the... I am. I am. I'm in. Oh, can you override them? <laughs> I don't think. I don't think. You, you, to, uh, you, you just stop sharing. You just move the mouse around. around. You, you can remove the. the yes. There you go. There you go. There you go. No, just let. Uh, I'm not allowed to. I need to be. No, made, no. Just stop <clears> in, uh, I need to be made uh, co-host or something. No, it's. If you remove the HDMI, he can share the screen. Okay. It's the ACS. There you go. Okay. All right. Uh, it's about this exactly this issue here, uh, which is the let's say the mm -hmm. I would say the <laughs> the shape of that uh, of that region here. I'm assuming here something which is not too different from what Carlos showed me yesterday in Alessandro. So this is so let's say what we're going to do in the first year. So I'm assuming here that in the north we can do about 300 square degrees. That's with some, I don't know, uh, some allowance for downtime. We don't start in March. We have, I mean, kind of a, I would say, maybe conservative uh, assumptions. Uh, because of the issue that exactly that Alberto told, uh, we need to be uh, as compact as possible, minimizing the uh, the circumference of that area of that volume uh, by area. So what we can do uh, roughly, if you do, for instance, a deck of 40 a strike, and I'm guessing from conversations also that this is kind of what would be optimal to do during the 
the survey is that you do a, a strike which is only five CCDs uh, wide, sorry, uh, in, in height, and about uh, 140 in RA. So that's the, the dark one that you're seeing here, right? Which one here? Just tell us this one here. Okay. Or you can do something which is a bit fatter, which is eight CCDs. So you would have the middle there would be perhaps uh, four four CCDs with all the all the filters. So you'd have, in this case, kind of a a bit less than a half of the volume of that area in all filters. Um, and then uh, this would be between, say, I mean, you can move this, like Alessandro said, you can move this to the left, to the right, it doesn't matter. Uh, or you can do something which is 12 CCDs, which is this uh, lighter region here, between 150 and 210. So if, if, ever, if anybody is interested in doing all filters, we want something that looks more, more I mean, I think, more, looks more like the third option, because that would give you uh, a higher fraction of the area covered in all filters. So that's that's better for the science. I'm not sure if it's easier on the observations because then at the end here, you the telescope might be wanted to point here, but you wanted to point there. But you know, it's it's what we would want from the science. Uh, so those are some options for 40. Now, say we want to go upper for mini J pass or for uh, or for NAP, uh, if you want to make one region, I, I haven't been able to find a solution where both are in. It's either one or the other, um, because uh, in this case, for instance, the 12 CCDs, they can, not even then you can get on the upper left corner NAP and in the lower left corner mini J pass. I, I mean, this is again being conservative, but I don't I don't think it's may, maybe it's not feasible. It's kind of it may be a risk. Uh, in which case we would have one region around one, another region around another, and they would be disjoint. So uh, one question. Though. Well, this is I mean this is just of course like I said back of the envelope things, but you, I'm assuming here about 300 square degrees in the north in the first year. So what would be the inefficiency if there were two big regions? Uh, sorry? The inefficiency in terms of uh, predicted inefficiency. We made the numbers such as these ones many years ago. Many years ago, yeah. And the point is, when you reach a reasonable area, something like 100 square degrees, 150, so it's not small, it's already right. average. Um, if you had it like perfectly square, which is ideal, you, your efficiency is 80%. So 80% of the area is fully covered. Okay. As you move to more rectangular shapes, you very quickly fall down. Mm -hmm. Not very quickly, but maybe if your factoring distances is larger than two to one, two and a half to one, you already yeah. go down to 50%, mm -hmm. 40%. And by the way, this this dark area here on the figure, it's only five CCDs. So that's, if you, if you can imagine, our camera has four CCDs. <laughs> so, so in this case, I think it's, I don't think there's right. any part of it that is covering all filters because you're just moving the, the camera one CCD up. You make a pass in one and then you move one CCD up or down and that's it. So in this case, you have zero actually. Yeah. No, no part of this region has all filters at all. This part here has eight CCDs. So I guess that it's about one third of the area, right? I mean, it's eight. Can you make a calculation in your head? Or you think it's well, it's a, maybe you actually have four, a, one or two CCDs. Yeah, you, you, you four have, high and then four high. On yeah, the area and mix. So, so I don't know, between a third and a half, something like this. And then this lighter area here, that I would say it's more, I would say more than 50%, maybe six. I, I haven't really made a calculation. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can re yeah, I can remind you uh, it's about that. In this case, it's 12 CCDs, but again, you so the, the big issue here is because of how fast you can grow the sky compared to how fast the sky is running from you yeah. every night. Yeah, I have so even considered what's the, that. What's the size of the vertical column that you can cover in one night? That, yes. That's the basic yeah. question. 
So in this case here, by the way, if we study March, we would want to observe over here. Is that correct? What? what over here, is? where my mouse is. In March. March. In March. 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 Yeah, so this is kind of very far away. I mean, I, I guess we could point, but it's, I don't know. I, I, I don't even know if we could point there. But anyway, that's, those are, I think, constraints that we have to keep in mind. If we believe that the camera is starting in March, if we believe that the speed is more or less between what Carlos is projecting, what Alessandro is projecting, and so on. So those are just to keep in mind. I'll stop sharing now. I can I can I can send those slides to you if you want. All right. I mean I have I'm a little bit worried that I mean we I mean we've been saying one million times, and let me say say it for the one million and the first time, that we absolutely have to cover the 40 yeah. declination plus 40 at those right ascensions. This is the priority for us. This is the, the hectomap field. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, yeah. by the way, covered in here. If you move this region a bit to the left, you have hectomap in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I hear people making decisions for the cluster group, what's best for the cluster group. For God's sake, hectomap is our priority number one. And I can tell you in the morning, in the evening, in the night, you wake me up in the night, I'll tell you this is our priority field, okay? If that is not clear, I don't know. <laughs> hey, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, my friend. <laughs> can, you repeat, can you repeat that? <laughs> so, uh, can, can I just... Uh, that, they have to a question now. Yeah. Can I? So, that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a main issue with that, Thomas. In uh, right ascension, it almost coincides with uh, mini J pass. So at this point, which is which? Do you prefer mommy or daddy? That depends for what. Uh, what is the, you know, the, in terms of cluster uh, cosmology yeah. lensing, this is has a higher priority. Uh, I mean, but in any case, we're talking about 43 square degrees there, and a low efficiency because it's rectangular. Slow. But if you have, let's say, 600 square degrees, you can, uh, you can do two squares in the points of interest that are really big and cover the ectomass as well. Just uh, If it's 600 square degrees, keep in mind, it's 600 square degrees divided around the, the seeds, yeah. right? So it's, yeah. it's uh, assume that you have 600 and you have six seeds, it means 100 square degrees around each seed. So, and the, and the connected, you cannot put two seeds, one on hectomap and one on uh, mini J pass because they're going to conflict with each other. Hectomap is always going to win. So I, I am completely agnostic. There's going to be catastrophic variables everywhere. So, um, so of course, I mean, this is a decision which is SSC SS decision. Yeah, and it was great to get this number, by the way. Very good to get this ballpark in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what, what so uh, Eduardo was asking, so yeah. we couldn't cover at the same time Ectomap and mini j -Pass. We have to make it both to make it more compact and run up a little bit like yes, that. But the answer is no. But the, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that was, that's what I was going to ask Alessandro, because it might be, you, it's yeah. too far in RA and it's too long in that. Perhaps for good observations. It's, it's too short in there. It's okay, too so short sorry. in the in the sense. Right. So it, that's not going to happen. Okay. So I just put an X here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, yeah, that's a common one. X to J generally means target. And I don't So like so um okay before I move on. So let me just go through uh, a couple more things because it's basically already reinforcing well, the idea. Silvia like, was trying to. Oh, Silvia, I can see people asking things there. Silvia, have a. Uh, Thanks, comment? Gemma. No, it's a very quick thing. I mean, uh, again, I, I guess uh, Raul was referring to possibly first uh, large contiguous area, right? I mean, okay. at, at the end, Mini J Pass could still remain a seed and start growing from Mini J Pass. Okay. And not maybe be one of the first big contiguous area, but we will still have data there, right? It could still remain the seed in case we prioritize more to, in the aptomap region, right? I think the answer was no. Sorry? I thought the answer from Alexandra was but that was not possible. Yeah. I mean, it's not possible if you want to join them right away, but 
uh, I mean, you could still observe that seed while you are prioritizing that area uh, in the way Raul was saying, right? No, no, no. I, either you either you observe ectomark or you observe mini J pass. Yeah, but I think what Sylvia is saying is that let's say you prioritize ectomark in the first year, in the second year, because mini J pass is close to ectomark, it's likely that the survey will yeah, go over there. Sure. Right. I guess this is what you're saying, Sylvia. I'm sorry, I'm mansplaining things to you. Yeah, but... yeah. Something. No, no. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's something along those lines. I mean, I'm. I, my my under like the way I mean just looking at the plots it would seem like ectomap would be the natural growth of this possible third seed that, that we would put in between the erosita and the mini J pass. Anyway, go ahead and then we can go back to that. So I'll just go a few more slides and go back to um, a, a relevant uh, plot from. Antonio, so uh, so as I said, we, we are already doing this, seeing how can we get some uh, science return fast. One of the ways we know what the, the best one is for, uh, for the clusters. Which one was it again, Alexis? <laughs> <laughs> and for some others we know, but you can also optimize the ret science return by coupling with different missions that have different wavelengths and uh, we're having, having a very good uh, experience so far with this. Mm -hmm. Now with uh, JWST and so on. And one of them is the NAP, not JNAP. Okay, so no, no. I think people are talking about JNAP uh, all the time. He's an unbiased person here. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and those are different things. Okay, JNAP is like this small, and it happens to be the hour second point, which joins exactly with a bunch of HST data and now with JWST data. Yeah, and we are closing an MOU with them to uh, share the discoveries and exploit the data jointly. <laughs> NAP is much bigger. Mm. And it's also a field that has uh, different coverage, uh, you know, Herschel, Spitzer, Akari, <laughs> and, and others. So it, it's a, a, a pre uh, multi wavelength region. One of the famous uh, uh, objects there from the time that I I was working with Chris Wallace, it's the, the supercluster, NAP supercluster. And so Raza, this is close enough, we can get many, this is 0 0.08, many nice uh, pictures for galaxies, and uh, just 30 galaxies in different environments from groups to there's 13 clusters there, tunnel groups, and so on. Uh, this is a, a schematics, this is just a projection that I did a long time ago when I was looking at some some absorption quasars here, I forgot to take them out, but the squares here are basically the clusters and so on. So it's about, you know, 10, we're talking here about, uh, uh, so this will cover, will be uh, seven by seven, something like this. You can cover the whole region. And I think Matt is gonna uh, talk some more about this uh, in the afternoon. Yes. Uh, I'm putting here the weave footprint, uh, copy again, so people remember where it falls in the in the general path that the uh, showed us. Um, the EBOS, okay, doesn't quite go, maybe you know, there was, you can have an idea where it is, mm -hmm. which is important for the cosmology. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna stop here and go back to Antonio's plot. <laughs> I don't really care about the footprint. I just wanted to open a different melon just to discuss. And it's the thing that since it seems that we are going for winning one by one, I think we should still uh, keep the nominal depth of, of James, at least for the hundred something square degrees where we go with all the ones. For, for this part, we, we need the nominal depth. And the, the reason is the impact that this is going to have in the photosynthesis, of course, or this is why I care. Uh, if you don't like this idea, you then don't have any right to complain that the photosynthesis are crappy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just wanted disclaimer. to show you this figure to, see you, to, to show you what is the impact in the photosynthesis of a, a decrease of half a magnitude in the mm -hmm. depth. So don't look at the at the numbers, look at the slope of the of the curve, right? So at, at faint, so maybe, maybe the mouse. Uh, yeah. Is that, yeah. 
at at the fainter magnitudes, this is low. Mm -hmm. But well, I, I'm I'm pointing to to this line because this is, I think the <clears throat> the most realistic. This is this will compute with all the narrow filters plus R and I. But if we remove R, it's probably going to be more or less the same. So uh, this is also for a 50% completeness. I mean, we are already taking out half of the sample with the lower odds. And look at this slope. <laughs> if we uh, go half a magnitude uh, uh, shallower, we are losing. Well, I mean, the, the, the sigma and mat is going down. Is going up by almost a factor of two. At whatever cut in magnitude you want to, the, the slope, this is almost a straight line, right? So if we go half a magnitude shallower, it's a factor two almost worse in the photosynthesis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The numbers are going to be different because we are going to improve the photo C codes and whatever. But the comparison is, is that half a magnitude, factor two in photo C Can I ask a question, Tony? Um, uh, for this completeness, for the 50% completeness sample, so the better ones, you have a rough idea about which one of those are resolved, extended objects, and, with, and how many are more like point sources, or they are, are they mostly one or the other? Do you kind of recall, or you don't have those numbers in your head? If it is a big result galaxy, it's going to be in the 50%, of course. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the, 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 the good 50% is the brighter ones, the brighter ones. Typically, which tend to be resolved. And a few of the faint ones that have strong lines or no fit. So it sounds imperative that we try to go bidding, fix the. I guess we have to increase the photo time. Mm -hmm. that. Do we, uh, by the way, do we, uh, we don't know anymore if the readout mode that we chose is ideal anymore now, right? Without being it's, uh, something we might need to revisit. Oh. Yeah. Can, can we make an estimate based on mini JPass, or we don't have data from mini JPass without bidding that allows us to do that? I don't think we do, right? So we need an ETC like yesterday. <laughs> so I have a question. I think uh, Tommy or after. Uh, do we know already if the, the impact of the, the, the blooming on the narrow bands? I mean, the impact of the, of the yeah, if you see the same effect, the same issue, the same problem, you saw the broadbands. So that let us we see. we haven't had time to to characterize the impact of the of the blooming in the two by two binning images using narrowband filters. Okay. So the, the only test that we have so far is with the broadband filters. Okay. So this is an effect that is coming from the electronics of the the, the close electronics of the system. We need to live with that, but I think that the next steps are to characterize what is the impact that they are having in, in the real data, which is the, the narrow band filters network. We need to understand what is the real impact on the, on the final quality of the data. So we mentioned that because I think it's a word of caution that we have identified a potential problem there, but has not been characterized and the real impact on the final data has not been understood yet. So okay. this is something that we will uh, test as soon as we can. And, and once we characterize, uh, I mean, how important it is, uh, it may become or may not a relevant uh, parameter in the discussion. Okay. So it's we a problem with interrogation work. Mm. We definitely need a plan mm. in case. I mean, this is certain that, that some, for, for some stars, we will have that effect. But what is not clear is for what is the frequency of that uh, effect appearing in the different point views. Because if this, is the, if this is the same level, which is not going to be for sure, that we are observing in the broadband, this is killing a significant fraction of the, of the area. But the amount of light that, that goes through the broadband filter is. is uh, Several factors, so in the, the narrow band. So it, it may 
it may also depend on the wavelength, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, I don't know, this is still a little, a little bit premature to progress on, on that discussion. So I think that we all need to be aware that this issue, but, uh, but we need to characterize. So to evaluate it. Can I uh, <coughs> correct me if I'm, there are many ways that this can go. One is that the problem is serious, we cannot do two by two thinning at all. We have to do it one by one, and then we have to think about exposure without, we have to rethink. And the, and the speed of the survey will be different than the one we can forecast. Mm -hmm. Second case is that there is a problem, but we find a way around it in some way, like maybe making shorter exposures so that it doesn't saturate or we lose a bit of the area, we live with that. And exactly, the, in that case, yeah. probably it would not be that fast. So probably the first science certificate would be still funded until a solution is found. No, but I mean, if we go for this second option, which is an option, yes. but of course the overheads will be increased. So yeah, it will have an impact also on the on yeah. the cadence of the power yeah. 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 yes. it, it still has uh, an impact on yeah. the cadence. And then, you know, if we find that there is just, oh, we just need to switch this thing here and then it solves and then we are back to the speed that we were forecasting. Yeah. But this comes back to one thing which I think I'm stressing here. <laughs> Uh, we need to make some projections, I think, for these plans A, B, and C, and the uh, ETC. Uh, Jesus had an ETC. I remember sending him, like, ah, can, can, you, can you estimate this? Is this something we can retrieve from Jesus' stuff, yes. or that would be super, super useful? I, I, I can um, do all the numbers that I'll need. Okay. Cool. Uh, yes, some things can be, will not change the plan. It may change the time that we get the, the yeah. cover. Um, I don't remember if Hector showed uh, an image of the issue of the in his talk. It might be useful to at some point just show so people can have some, have some insights on the actual issue. It's very good. <laughs> So, yes, if you want to take the okay, yes, uh, uh, I'm having trouble uh, uh, trying to understand the, the, the discussion that's going on in the audience because the audio is low. And uh, but at some point, I would like uh, to have a space to discuss the request I'm making that uh, no uh, broadband observation is made when the scene is worse than median or something like that. So I, I, I made this request several times, but it, it never appears in any document or uh, is a feasibility study uh, related to that. So I'm putting a formal request that this is at least a study. There's a lot of studies that require, uh, for, for instance, morphology of galaxies and things like that, that would benefit from that. So in the beginning of the discussion of JPEG, that was a, a given that that, 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 was, that was going to be the case. But, uh, well, of course, I don't know all the technical details, but I just like uh, this, is, this issue to be taken seriously. So, so my understanding is that this is the baseline that we are observing with the program filters or filter when when the scene conditions are are best are yes. optimal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is not being discussed. I may be wrong, but my understanding is that because this is the baseline. So this this has been already <laughs> with respect to uh, technical. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. <laughs> so but th that was not I heard last time uh, we discussed in the working groups that it was really tough to change the trays, etc. So that was not feasible. I can, I can now comment on the on the technical parts. Uh, and I mean, with respect, with respect to the, the strategy, Ale may just uh, jump at any time. But Ale, I don't see you, but I... I'm <laughs> jumping. Jumping. And it works. And, and this baseline actually doesn't uh, appear in any of the documentation. So if it's a baseline, I, I would uh, be really happy to read that in the document. From the technical point of view, now the 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 I band fitted tray or whatever broadband filter that is finally decided, I assume it now I band according to the discussions that we are having, the I band filter tray will be permanently installed in the in the camera. So we will be in a position to observe with this 
filter at any time. There are some restrictions, uh, mechanical restrictions, given to the, the design and the final performances of the system. That means that we cannot change the fit, a filter tray if the telescope is too low in elevation. But this is not going to be the case most of the time because we will be observing as I mean at, at lowest air mass possible. So we can change the fit the tray with the telescope at angles up to 30 degrees. I'm talking by memory, but about 30 degrees from zenith. So my understanding is that most of the time the overhead implied to, to the filter tray exchange will be something very reasonable, probably a couple of minutes required just to, to rechange the filter and probably. Uh, I mean, three minutes to, to refocus the system. So I don't see any, any showstopper from the technical point of view and from the strategic point of view. And again, Ali, correct me if, if I'm saying something that is not correct. It is, I think, it is assumed that the program filter will be used with the best same conditions. True. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Let's put that in the documentation. <laughs> Can I comment something? Um, I. I I also second Tony in this like I, that's also what I always assumed that the best uh, photometric nights were dedicated to the broadband. Now it's an interesting thing to to do characterize what is the maximum allowed uh, thing, right? Because uh, I, I think my, in my mind it's somehow below one point nine or one or seconds. But uh, I think Edu, you were actually mentioning something around the median, right? So more point seven. So maybe um, it would be nice though to, to define what is the maximum allowed uh, seeing for, for the eye, in this case, eye band observations. And possibly that should be something that could be tested during science verification, right? Can I also add something to that? Because it's not only a question of the shape of the images that Eduardo cares about, because eye band will be our detection band. So we want this to be absolutely very good seeing. Otherwise, we just you know we are losing completeness there. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, every everybody needs this anyway. It's just a matter of I guess what Silvia said. What are the numbers really? Right? I, I I don't know actually actually what are the numbers. So writing this down in some document is the most important thing. Is coming down with which number we're talking about, right? That is this is I don't know. This is up to you guys. <laughs> Yeah, but I fully agree with you. Yes, we should define that uh, when good seeing conditions uh, are considered to, to inject the broadband filter tray. I think this is very a very important piece of information that is needed from the the strategy point of view. So it seems that one of the first uh, Dava tasks, actually, and probably possibly Eduardo should be highly involved in that, would be. To pass uh, like a large, take a large numbers of I band images with in different scene condition, different, uh, and then test right away, like as fast as possible, what's the performance, right? Yeah. Well, I just said throw the, the median number because, of course, half of the nights will be, will be good. Uh, the, that's not too restrictive, but uh, we, sh we should study that, yes. So um, just so you know what we're talking about here, uh, uh, perhaps an uh, actor uh, can explain it a bit more, but this is the issue with uh, mm -hmm. the, bin, the blooming. Can you maximize this? Okay. Uh, yes, I will try. Okay, actually what you, what you are seeing here is uh, this is the same quality. You are seeing, sorry for the ones that are connected, you won't see the pointer, but on the left you have. I need a big drum out. Yeah, I can use mine. You can use yours. You can you can make the full frame also, make it bigger. This, yeah. So this is the same, the same pointing. Actually, this is the Rosetta Niguna, and and you can see uh, on the left you have uh, an image taken with binning uh, one uh, two by three. This is not one sixty seconds exposure. This is always uh, uh, filter G. This is G now. 
in both cases. And then on the right, you have the same pointing. Actually, you are seeing the, the city in the center uh, with mode zero, which means full frame, and 180 seconds, which means this is to illustrate that this is not happening with full frame. Uh, what is happening? This happening is what you see uh, here on the on the left. And whenever there is a, a, a saturation, the regions there are some rows that are affected, uh, and, and and as you can see, are affected uh, in a in a in a degree. So, so I thought it, so you made 180 second exposures in the G band with and without thinning, and you compared. Uh, Actually, I'm not sure if we did uh, with 180. Maybe, maybe we, we 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 didn't because we saw that and we just record what was happening there. <coughs> and actually, we, we there is no plan for doing such exposure with thinning. But uh, so the question is, as you can see, is this happening? Uh, if you if you look in detail, it, you will see that effect in any most of the saturation that you have in, in every CCD. Can I ask a question? If you take that exact image there with a resource like this, which is saturation, with less and less exposure time, would you expect that black stripe to be smaller or at some point to disappear? Yes. Yeah. Actually, I think you can see it from the image that it will happen. And the point is, this is a 66 second image with broken. With broken yes. Yes. We didn't have the opportunity to test it with narrow band filters and see how, what is the extent of the of the effect. Of course, if you have a very bright source, you will have it for sure. Yeah. But on average, you expect to have very few uh, cases, but we have to assess exactly what is the effect. So roughly speaking, the narrow bands are eight times smaller fast band and 30 second exposures which is which is one sixth so that's uh, like one six, no 60 60, 60. 60. 60 exposures yeah. 60 seconds so one third so it's a factor of three times a factor of uh of eight so it's a factor of like 24 less flux in the mm -hmm. narrow bands for those same objects right so this is why i think we have to wait for having those changes but what we know for sure is that if we have a very bright source, what we, what, what we could expect is something, is something like this. Oh. Actually, what was not clear to me is that this is not systematic. There are some, there are some bright sources that we now have in your window, right? Some do. Yeah. It might have to do with the region of the CCD, right? Mm, we need, I mean, there is something that we. Uh, okay, with, with this is something that we want to discuss with the dining to be, but we decided not to go through this because we had a big other, issue. Other <laughs> 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 so it, was, it was something that we recorded, we know that it's happening, we plan to, 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 to discuss with the dining to be. Uh, we have an idea of what is happening, maybe once they come to South, we just lock but, them in. Uh, yeah, we only okay. understand what is, what is coming, but you, your point is good because actually, yeah, in, just in that case, you have saturation and you don't have that, that effect. Uh, in principle, already now, you can predict how many stars can we know their positions in the sky, which you where you will have the effect also in the narrow because you just need a, you know, bright uh, stars and they are well known. No? So if they are everywhere, then uh, that's it, we are done. No? I'm sure you mentioned this, but I didn't know. Sorry, this is every CCD. Some CCDs is worse than others. So it's mm. in all the all the CCDs. All the CCDs. Okay. I have checked, for instance, for this case, and I look for each of the CCDs. Mm -hmm. You have storm effect in, mm -hmm. in <laughs> but not all stars. It's a fraction of them. Yeah, fraction. Yeah. No, it's, no, no even they have to be bright, and no. okay. it's a CCD performance. It has yeah. nothing. They don't hate the CCD doesn't hate the star, it hates too many electrons. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I've been I've been I've been simulating that, that yeah. CCD effects. 
I know even how to work with the data that's extracted. It, it's, uh, it's just not enough for many elections. So <laughs> that's the problem. And it, it, it kind of it reads out, it, it clears the path, it makes the city less efficient, more efficient. It, it's charge transfer efficient, that changes. We need to do that. And it's the uh, you have, you have to use this active pixel one in the reader. <laughs> I mean, if you want, I can give you like a two minute uh, technical explanation so you have a, a better understanding. I don't know if you want to share. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, we identified this problem several months ago, but we have been focused with Teledangi to be on the electronics repair. Uh, and this is, they are aware of that, but we haven't spent time with them to fix that. So I try to, I mean, to understand that. I'm, I'm always trying to be optimistic, so I think there is a 1% probability that that can be improved from the design point of view. But let's forget about that, because I, I really don't think this is the case. So the problem or the situation, in my understanding, this is my interpretation, and I'm not an electronics engineer, is that the, the CCD pixels have a full well of about 90k electrons. The registers that are at the end, when we... So the CCD, for instance, here, they are, so this is the, the amplifiers are read out in this area. This is where the, the electronics, the registers are. They are just reading out the, the potential, the, the number of electrons that are there in, in, in each pixel. The register, the serial registers have a full well of 140K electrons. So in one by one, there is no problem of saturation at the register level because 90 is lower than, than 140. The only thing that we see in the in the uh, one by one is the blooming effect. That is, is this vertical line that appears, white vertical line around the stars. This is something that we have assumed. We have to assume. What happens when do we do a two by two binning is that we are summing up four pixels. So it's four times 90, so 360. So it's higher than 140. So there is a saturation, a blooming effect. I mean, a, a, an extreme saturation that uh, generates a blooming effect at the register, um, serial register e level. So if, when you have a, a even a, if you were let, almost three times below filling the wells, it's yes. still a problem because yeah. there are, so the limit not is, is, is not the saturation of the pixels. It's like a third saturation. of the saturation of the pixel. Yeah. Right. So saturation at the end, right. we, we have to uh, put a limit there and say, okay, so the saturation of the pixels appear at 60K or something like that, because depending on the, on the gain and uh, all the parameters, but let's assume 60K. So we know that stars with a, flow, a flux more than 20K <laughs> will start generating problems in the, at the serial register level. Well, what magnitude so, does that correspond to? <laughs> I don't know. This is something that, that, that we need to understand for the, for the narrow one thing. I don't understand anything, but the way you express yeah. this, this seems like an obvious design flaw. Right? <laughs> this, is a, this is something that, that, that was uh, uh, a, design, a design limitation. It sure. wasn't designed for uh, binning. It, it was designed for binning, but no, I, I, don't, I don't know why this, this part was not so, so this is is so, but guys, the all the CCDs have yeah, this so problem. this is happening in all the CCDs. All the CCDs have this problem. But not in systematically. Not. So it means that the... Yeah, the, but, the, but I, the, the, the non systematic that, that you mentioned, there is also that the, the full well of the uh, CCD varies from amplifier to amplifier. Right. And the same thing applies to the full well of the serial registers. So there is some modulation there. But it is true that it is my understanding that this is a modulation, and there we see saturated stars that are not showing this blooming effect. Exactly. So there's three things that I don't fully understand. That's why I think I, I mentioned that this is my my best guess. But my best guess. But I need to to we need to work with Teledyne to, to fully understand that to explore possibilities of reducing the the effect from the design and the hardware point of view, and on our side to evaluate the impact on the real observation and the impact that it may have eventually on, on, on JPAS. You know that before we start making decisions, right? Just just one uh, just one curious curiosity. The Pathfinder was supposed to be the exact same CCD, but it did not show that problem. Within a survey in or you did test the test it in that regime. The Pathfinder was also always observing one by one uh, mode. 
Even for the narrow bands, one by one? Yes, also? Uh, it was always one by one. Because the two by two beginning for the. I, I think it was one by one. It's actually not here. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the two by two uh, mode in the Pathfinder was not uh, tested. I, I mean, this is my <laughs> I will wait for the one by one. But in any case, the electronics are different in the two instruments. No, no, no. But, but wait, wait. If, if the Pathfinder is exactly the same and. Oh, we, oh, I see. You only did if it only did it one by one. We wouldn't know if two by two bidding if you yeah. had the same problem appeared in the it's okay. and, and this, is another, this is something we haven't tested. Yeah. And then there is another uh, question here: Is that when we started the the design? I mean, the, the manufacture of the CCDs, they were anti blooming CCDs. But then, in some month, twenty twelve, Teledyne it to be during the development of those CCDs decided to make them non anti blooming so to to to, uh, to to remove so they are not anti blooming uh, ccds because there were a tear effect that they wanted to correct and they corrected so the first ccd that we received uh, the tat camera ccd is anti blooming so i'm pretty confident that part of those effects won't be observed there but the, these ccds in jpcam they are uh, from a different manner i'm not sure when i mean the pathfinder ccd that was an engineering grade ccd i'm not sure if this is anti-blooming or it is not so so there is we need to spend more time on on that so fully so so fix on the ccd not on the electronics around it's on the ccd so there are two effects. One is the CCD, so the, the blooming that we see in the vertical line, I'm not sure about the register, the serial register, that depends on the CCD. And the register is embedded in the CCD, that's my question. It's not in the hardware of the camera, it's part of the CCD. The register? No, the, the, I, not 100% not sure. No. So this is just a, a yes, guesstimate, I guess. just, uh, just to, to have an idea, anything that makes sense to see. explain what we are observing, with but, the but this is work in progress yet. Yeah. With the engineer, this is, a, this is a matter for the engineer. We can speculate here, but I think it's a matter of... Uh, it's it's only the design to be engineers that can, can work on that, but, but I mean, I'm sure you understand that we didn't uh, put pressure on Teledyne on, on that point because we were trying to have okay. all the pressure on the repair mission. But by the way, yesterday they confirmed that they are coming yeah. to the end of the 16th. Ah, so the, the date is now fixed. Ah. Oh, oh, all right. So which are they coming? 16th. January the 16th. Okay. okay. And then they'll be locked down. <laughs> <laughs> and then some food. No work. No They will be locked down at the observatory. <laughs> Hotel California. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was very useful. Thank you, Esther, showing this the, the image. It is good to see what you're fighting with. Um, so, I, I think uh, one thing they'd like to, and now, since we're going to have time, because some people are missing uh, and are coming for next talks, so I can just talk a little bit of the way I'd like to. Hit anybody else here? No physical violence. Yes, but you talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> so, in terms of the future priority, <laughs> so um, not for the science verification. Right? This is not a um, concern here because uh, we're going to be using. Uh, all filters for the, the science certification, meaning what's necessary for what kinds of calibration and so on, be it at least for the minimum area coverage or whatever is necessary for the full first year. Now, after the science verification, we'll, we'll know, like we talked before, the JCCAM performance, the survey speed, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I don't know who has data about the, the average fluctuation of the survey speed over the last few years. Uh, for J plus, that would be uh, useful to know what's the standard very uh, deviation from the expected. And if there's a trend with the weather, is it getting worse, better, and things like this would be useful. But after this certification, we're going to have a much better uh, idea of how to decide this big uh, possible risky, more risky. And so I decided to put here a few risks. Um, and um, 
as I see it, they have to keep in mind. Uh, so if we do, we go for science priority uh, for, uh, for priority for trades one and two, uh, which is requested uh, good for uh, some cosmologists. Uh, the the co cosmology constraints with cluster, not cluster cosmology. That's out, out of that. Um, one of the main questions that I saw the discussion here, I'm glad it was remotely. So, <laughs> so <laughs> <that's> not, fine. <laughs> But the question is, uh, this is a, a, a risk analysis, right? Like anything else. You're gonna get a mortgage to buy a house. You wanna go with a fixed uh, interest rate or let it vary. If you let it vary, then in a few years, maybe it will be on where you can pay and you lose the house and you lose everything. Right. So the question is, suppose something goes wrong with JP Camp in a couple of years, or one year from now. Something, and things can go wrong, yeah. not just a meteorite drop. It's kind of a problem that will cost $2 million to solve. Mm -hmm. Who is going to raise the money? And we know that this can take several years and delay and kill the project. So why are you left with <clears throat> right? So if you go and you prioritize the blue trace, you end up with, at the end, JPS being, I don't know, 300 square degrees, 200 square degrees of actual JPS, plus a lot of things you're not really JPAS. And that's it. That's your legacy. <clears throat> right. Um, if you do medium priority for the trace, then JPAS will grow slower. It will still be uh, JPAS, but the cosmological constraints from clustering we will have to wait some. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to that point before you guys throw tomatoes at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you go to the maximum priority for everything, JPS grows, grows as I showed, and we have 650 plus minus uh, whatever per year and in there. And uh, so the cosmological constraints from clustering weight significantly. So uh, I know what other things seems to need to be considered. Yeah, there's a uh, uh, four. Point, which is a combination of the other three. Right. For instance, I would find very reasonable starting first year with a priority on all trades. That's going to keep us busy for a while. You know, with as much uh, idea we can do in one year with all trades. And then you go for the speed, you know, for volume. But at least have the first um, uh, data uh, release, internal data release. With enough information for all the all the different topics that we can cover, and that's going to be enough data for everybody okay, for not one year but several years. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I agree with what Chema said, but I would also like to remind everybody, you know, we had this discussion again several times, that the strategy for the first year, call it first year, first six months, whatever, very probably will define itself. So maybe you want to do this and that trade, but today this trade is not available or the trade changer is not working as well as expected, or we need some electronics to, or we want to cover that particular area with the only trade that is missing, but we have one week of bad weather. I mean, many things will just come through. So I, point is, I would avoid making a very defined definition of exactly what we are going to do at the beginning because at the beginning i mean hell will happen for sure yeah, yeah. yeah. you still need a plan of course yes yes yeah. 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 right uh, yeah. just those are things that we have to worry about exactly today uh, but i think we should start thinking because uh, after sv we're gonna yeah, my point is that if we start to define in terms of five percent of the time or ten percent of the time maybe that's just we don't know yet. That right. doesn't yeah, if everything was fantastically well and uh, our estimation is wrong on the good side, and we got like a thousand square degrees uh, with the full trace. Uh, yeah, may, can... may, maybe this could just mention some of my predictions for a less I have my own script. Maybe it's more realistic or less realistic depending on what we look at. So maybe I can show, project some some slides. Sure. Like can you? I'm blocking, so I can share the screen. Okay. Right. While you wait, Sylvia has a question. Uh, can you stop sharing? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually my comment is actually similar to both along the lines of Chema and, and Alberto, in the sense that I think, yeah, it would be good to define what we want to show first to the, let's say, to the um, full community outside j -Pass, so what j -Pass can do at the beginning, right? Um, we need to think as well, so of course, like uh, the a first period with the uh, priority to all filters, certainly it is a must. But then we also have to think in long terms, right? And again, what is the science return uh, that we get at different phases? And then the strategy may also adapt itself to it, right? To, to, and we have to be flexible in that sense. Um, also rem re reminding also everyone that, uh, you know, only tray one and two can be observed, so, sorry, tray three and four can be observed uh, during uh, brighter times. So in any case, uh, you know, there will always be also, even if we prioritize tray one and two, tray three and four will always be observed as well. So I think I, I really see it as a slow weight, like a little weight of priorities, right? Not certainly something that would drop or eliminate other filters. Um, yeah, but I think, uh, again, also going back to also what Alessandro stressed yesterday in the discussion, Again, what is the minimum requirement, the, the timing when the arrival of, uh, of data and uh, uh, is required, those are the key things to know. And also a bit in general, I mean, sorry, if I can comment a bit on this, I think I think JPASS is everything that comes out from this data, right? Images, uh, even just the broadband images is JPASS data. A combination of broadband and just one filter to select Lyman alpha at a very specific redshift is j -pass, if that, you know, that's the scientific output you get out. So I think everything that will come out of this is j -pass. Okay, sorry. I am, I leave it to you, Carlos. Uh, this, uh, this is another view of what Ale was showing before. Just to put you in context, uh, these numbers here are showing the number of of hours per month, as a, so this is work done already three years ago, but we're talking to Hector essentially, taking into account the, the amount of photometric nights, the amount of twilight hours that are included to the photometric nights. And then there is some number of, not negligible number of non photometric hours per month, where weather is not perfect, the sky is not perfect, but still can be used, right? And so there's a question what fraction of these non photometric hours can be used for the observation? So, of course, you know, as Alan was saying, there's a lot of uncertainties. The predictions, right? Here I'm just, you know, just, I'm just trying to be uh, of the conservative. I'm just taking 10% of these non automatic hours, all the automatic hours, and taking all the private hours too, as well, which are automatic. And then assuming that for the first year, so for this 2021 should be 2023, first year I'm assuming that we only are operative 60% of the time because we understand the system, and then every year we improve by 10%, 5% or so. Up to 95%. So only after five years or so, we are using 95% of the useful time. Okay. We are assuming that first years were hundred. So you do that. Let's see if I'm going to shoot. Then I'm assuming as well that there's no TIG and that there, we are not using anything on the open time. The open time is left as it is, and then we will use the open time application to do you know particular projects and to give cluster or whatever you want to So here in the top right. I'm showing the speed, assuming that the first year at the end of 2024, we devote the same priorities to both tall bands, right? I'm, I, I'm not repeating, by the way, I'm not double expo exposing trade. Okay. So you see that we are close to 500 square degrees for the first year in all bands, right? And then we we'll give a priority of around 70% you know, to the blue bands. Just to see uh, uh, and, and, and the rest for the red ones. So in this, in this way, we have like an increasing speed of, of this, this increasing speed is due to the improvement in the amount of time, in the effective time. Downtime times are shrinking, so as we understand throughout all the years, the system better. So it will go about 800 up to 1,000 or so until we finish the we, we are so sorry, which will be like 5,000 square degrees. Or slightly more, it's like 6,000 square degrees, I would suggest by, by, by Raul. In which case, the speed of the, of the area of the red server, of the red trace, will increase dramatically, right? So, as long as we are coming with it, we, we are not doing it. But I understand that these are a bunch of years. This is just one possible scenario, which seems very sensible to us. 
I want to hear the right solution people will be thinking about this, but you will have like a flat rate. So the first year you will have like 520 degrees, and then you will have like a flat rate of around between two and three and 400, 300 square degrees per year, right? Uh, this blue squares here are the nominal with QSO requirements. So I'm, I'm not an expert in QSO, I'm sure that, that Raul or Silvia can correct me here, but finally, once we miss this area, it's not the Cosmology constraints are delayed because width doesn't return to an area, right? So once we lose an area, it's lost for good, mm. right? It's lost forever, right? So it's not that those cosmological constraints are delayed, it's that they are lost forever. Okay. Let me just stress. Anyway, this is yet yeah, just to put more more petrol on the fire. <laughs> I'll right. give you more information for you guys. Right? As we were saying, we're just roughly in the same order of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have this uh, inefficiency mm -hmm. factor. So if one compensates with this inefficiency factor with the approach, and uh, yeah. consider the error bars yeah. that we're dealing with, yeah. Yeah. Well, basically that. But don't yet, but what do you think uh, that a 60% <laughs> efficiency for the first year is a good conservative? Uh, it's really, it doesn't really matter. Really it's a the efficiency. They can be even if you do 700%. So it's really, you can't really. Second year, 70%. Third year, 80%. Maybe I mean to optimize. And then we're flattening at 95%. Uh, and I'm going to play with these figures and see how it is. Also, Hector, I know you have updated figures for. For this, for the number of hours, yeah, they work for the automatic and automatic hours per month. I know you were doing for like eight hours in 2019. It's been two years since then, but uh, well, the numbers have changed immediately. I see the operation that I think they are i have uh, one uh, i mean you know we we have all this science verification you know questions coming up and all these questions uh, of how quickly the j pass uh, can proceed with time i think it also would be great to get similar numbers from the weave survey maybe maybe these numbers we are orienting to our optimistic and the speed is just a half of all projected on the street and then there is no problem at all. I think we also need those numbers to really uh, adjust our strategy, no? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, they are they are finishing uh, commissioning now. Sylvia, you you may correct me. Maybe you have a better memory of this. But um, but I think we I think they will know the speed. Uh, well, I think the speed will be pretty much the same. The, the issue is whether they can achieve the signal to noise that they want. Uh, but in any case, yeah, the is taken, they are finishing uh, commissioning right in the next, like, in February. So we should know for sure the answer to this. I don't know what the answer is now. So, uh, also, I mean, sorry, you know, any spectroscopic survey, you know, you have a uh, targeting efficiency, right? It's like, um i don't know what is the strategy there right do you do you know maybe maybe you only observe a quarter of the target just because because uh you, you have to deal with so many other inputs right i don't know we don't know you know it's one line i'm dealing with foremost we i i'm used to deal with 1000 lines of the service strategy. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's like everybody wants to to be uh, the focal plane, huh? not just the uh, QSOs. QSOs actually have an easier time, like compared to clusters on uh, any of these because we always get uh, a figure of man one hundred one hundred. But it, it, you know, it's it's also a strategy for it. Maybe you want to do a second pass. You know, maybe you will be doing second pass. I mean, all this this is important updates that we would like to to get. Yeah. which will allow the better planning. Yeah. yeah. So the way that it's being done right now is that there will be no second pass as far as they know, but of course this can change. I don't know. Uh, with QSO is, is only about 10% of the fibers they are sharing with, uh, with other surveys. So in that sense, they are 
they have a certain number of fibers for each pointing. Uh, so they are, I mean, the fiber collision, for instance, is not an issue for them because they are because of that. Now, uh, the efficiency is an issue for all surveys like this, but that is the advantage that, in principle, we have. We have a higher efficiency because of the type of selection fit better. How how exactly that is, we will know with yes. with SV. Yeah, and a check signal to noise, you know, all these conditions. Maybe yeah. you will have yeah. to stay longer on the human yeah. field. So I mean, this is you know important. So all of those all of those uh, those lines that Carlos is showing, it's uh, 10, 20 percent up or down for whatever it is it's don't know what they bad for weave also. So, uh, yeah, we, we have uh, yes. Just as, let me just say one thing is that we're gonna have to probably wrap up in, in ten minutes because we, the speaker actually. Uh, just uh, show that. Okay. So go ahead. No, no, just a question for to the 800 uh, degrees per year. Is uh, this quantity is a theoretical rate from the with QSO, what is name, or is something which are, how has been this uh, estimated? Can, can I add uh, to your question? So uh, one more question. Uh, first of all, uh, well, I'm going to put the last slide that I'll run. But before I do that, I, I think what Alex is saying is correct. We need to see how weave performance is to have an yeah. idea of how to collaborate and uh, to do what is required. Uh, remember, one thing that has been spoken a few times here, and I think there is a little bit of, well, sometimes the way you say things, the words mean something else, right? Uh, weave's required. Remember, the, the agreement that we have with you is on the best effort case. Okay, it's not set to no requirement. It, as long as it doesn't affect JPAS survey growth and other observability, that's it. So it's not like uh, we do or we die. No, we're doing the best effort basis. That's how it has always been. It has to be very clear here. I would like to see it going, but no, it depends on how we go. It depends on how they go. No, this is this. Is, but we want to fulfill this. This is completely clear. We, we do, yes, of course. But uh, sometimes when people say it looks like, oh, we're going to come in. So I can, reason. I so, can see how the 80, 800 yeah. square degrees per year came. Uh, it's the total. So with QSO has a certain um, uh, time duration, and uh, with QSO has a certain time, like. We've has lots of surveys inside of which one of them is with QSO. They have a certain share of the survey. So they so the area that they came together looking at the rate that we could do was something like six thousand square degrees. That's what allows them to be so the idea of weave is with QSO is being more complete than DESI, more objects with a large enough area that you can actually improve on DASI and being better than DASI at those those exactly places. and that comes to a second point yeah which is the well the two of them here uh, I'll, I'll go back to you but, but, but just so just to complete that was that was not independent of what we at the time forecast that we would be able to do uh for a cosmological survey in some sense so it wasn't it wasn't independent of course there was a there were lots of conversations to see if it was achievable mm -hmm. and uh and these things have changed. I mean, in the initial, initially back then, we were thinking more about 1,200 square degrees per year, and then we downgraded to 1,000 square degrees, and then realized, yes, we can still be doing better than Vendazzi and doing that job, and then we downgraded a bit more to below 1,000. Um, okay. Now, I, at some point, of course, if degrades so much that there's no point in doing it, then then we then if it's a reality we have to live with it and then that's a it becomes big, a quasi big, big really big crap sandwich. <laughs> 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 but no, uh, no, that's the question that I have. Yeah. Right? Because this effort and the question that I had is how revolutionary can we be in cosmological constraint from cost train in four to five years, which is the time that what was coming there with with KSO now. Are we going for something we're gonna screw the secrets of the universe there or are we gonna be like com compatible with the surveys that they're coming and they're being built right now. Well, if, if you demand that every science case must be revolutionary, then that's a only the ones pass, that risk, but... Only the ones that would risk other Sorry? sciences. Mm -hmm. Only those that would have to risk other sciences to achieve. Only well, those. yeah, right. So it's a, it's a question of how much you are gaining in the different scenarios, right? 
So like the scenario that Carlos is showing, you have a 500 square degrees in all filters in the first year and a thousand square degrees in all filters after three years. And then also this much larger area uh, of, I don't know how many, how many square degrees. Yeah. No, after three years, it's, it's more like... Yeah, 1,000 in the blue one and then yeah, that's really... Okay. Yeah, and then maybe, I think must be like something like 3,000 after three mm. years, right? Mm. So after three, years, after three years, we are in the blue, so we are almost 3,000. 2, yeah, 000. so 3,000 in the blue lens plus 1,000 in all the bands versus a situation where where maybe you didn't show them, yeah. but, 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 but the growth rate is about 500, 500 well, maybe. It's going to increase slightly, so in maybe 600 square degrees, degrees per year okay. versus a situation where you have, instead of 1,000 square degrees in all filters, you have 2,000 square degrees in all filters. So right. those are the scenarios. Okay. Well, where in fact, maybe it's time, uh, perhaps to write, uh, I don't know, uh, a, few a few pages of papers showing uh, what is gained precisely from that, because from the, Theoretical papers I've seen from JPS, the very interesting paper and so on. Um, okay, maybe you have better predictions, but uh, it looks like it. <laughs> but, uh, I agree mean, with you. We should do more realistic predictions. Right. To see if it's, we're going to really be upfront there and sacrifice the other science. It's way even thinking about sacrifice. Or, or it's going to be complementary, which is, has its value as well. But not so much. And I, think, I think we need predictions for both, not only from the equation or clustering sites, but also from the cosmological sites. Right. Like, you know, neutrino masses, you mentioned the neutrino masses. Yes. And, right. the, and, and, you know, cosmological parameters. Also, dark energy, not only see might or mega matter, but with cluster counts, cluster clustering distance. Right. We need to know how each of these science cases perform and the different studies. Right. The clusters, I just didn't put the clusters because they are not depending on. Um, this kind of investment, but they're not relying on WEEP or other surveys. So, um, and the, 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 what Sylvia pointed out that, um, you know, for her, any JPS, anything comes on JPS is JPS data, is one point of view, which is uh, a nice point of view. Now, for other people, you know, JPS data is how it was written in 2014, predicted in 2009. Uh, and uh, that's what we call mini JPS. Um, even in JPS has all the filters, it's JPS like there. Right? So, uh, and it coming back to the, I think what Chema raised, we, we go to a minimum what we consider to be enough, right? J, what, what's enough of JPS data to be considered what JPS survey is successful? Certainly not 100 degrees. This is not. Uh, 2,000 degrees, 1,000 degrees, so it's 20% full filters and 80% go risking somewhere else. It's 20% enough to be considered like we succeed in doing J-class there. Uh, so uh, this is something that we should keep in mind. Many of us wrote grants for a ton of money uh, to, for, to get the survey going. And we said a lot of things are what it be. If you come back with less than what, way less than what, Said, like Raza pointed out, it's not good. Well, I think, I think that the motivation of this survey was mainly cosmological, mm -hmm. right? Dark energy. That's why, you know, the, the seed of J pass, right? Yeah. These strategy changes are precisely geared, motivated towards improving or optimizing our constraints in that. I, can, can I say something? I'll, I'll bite uh, the, 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 uh, the bait that Alex rose uh, yesterday. I particularly, although, although you know, I came into this from a dark energy perspective, I don't particularly care about dark, dark energy. In fact, what I care about is the structure formation, the connection with galaxy evolution, and so on and so forth. This is what I really care about. I don't care about dark energy anymore. I don't think yeah. many people do, in fact. <laughs> but he owns... I remind you this is public. I know. <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's not the point, is that, it, uh, I, mean, I mean, the big picture here is that we, we're trying to make, uh, we're trying to make a really, uh, a big step in understanding life structure and in connection with galaxy evolution and so on at all scales at different redshifts. And I think this is a really critical piece of that puzzle that we can make the best survey that we that we have. We will do 
we will be the best survey in terms of, you know, this connection of galaxy evolution with structure formation on relatively lower redshift without filters, with, you know, thousands of square degrees in a few years. And we will also be able to do high redshift uh, look at that same picture at high redshift. So I don't really care about that. I need to be really. Can I also add one of the three poles of uh, of J pass when it was designed was the supernova path, which has been yes. uh, yeah. which is uh, killed in cold blood. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, and that we should actually think about depending how the performance goes, or perhaps some ways of doing uh, something about that. Because, for example. General ST, our agreement with General ST is in the in the NAP region, not exactly in the full NAP, but in the General ST region. That's the the continuous beam zone, the CVZ of General ST. So it's going to be coming back, back. Therefore, variable studies are very important. Once, the, if depending on this performance of GPS, maybe that that field may be monitored as well in the future. Period. So we should think about not just forgetting about the the, the supernova. I feel sorry about. Yeah, by the way, I have I, a silver. Yeah, you have a I want to say yeah. yeah. one, one important point is um, if, you, if you think about the efficiency of uh, a combination of two surveys, which is usually a product of two efficiency, <coughs> um, my guess okay, uh, is that in you perform your uh, weave observation, you run out of obese in a certain area. And you will come tell us, guys, just observe this. And you're going to only need 200 square degrees there. Okay. Because the rest you already have ready to go for a year. You just couldn't observe it, right? So basically, if you just adjust your strategy, your urgent request will, will might be quite doable for us. So, if, you know, if, if you, no, if, when yeah. you start like into the no, that's sur a survey execution, you will realize that. Yeah. yeah, we we uh, we were we were discussing about this uh, the day before. So the uh, so the the way that uh, that this has to go is that J Pass is going to be doing its observations, and we will be aware of that. And as long as we have enough square degrees, they can direct where we're going to observe. Mm -hmm. At least that is how it's being cast. If we have less area. They will observe that in any way, in any case, because of gal galaxy archaeology, and we low far and we lose that area, that's fine. We just miss a piece with spectra. Uh, if we have more, they can keep it for the next year. They can reschedule. Uh, so there will be for sure some inefficiency. You're, you're entirely correct. But they are not, in principle, what they, what they want to do is that they want to use, schedule their observations in terms of our weights, tier one, and, uh, and seeds. At least this is what they they told us, but you know it's yeah. of course yeah, it changes. I, I mean, if, if if something happens that we have to change something, I don't know then what's going to happen. If, yeah, but, but that's exactly the point. Let's say we are, we provide five hundred square degrees, or which hundred went into we planning and four hundred didn't. <clears throat> we did the four hundred for the next year. We only need to provide the six hundred. You know, I mean, it's it's going to be a continuous yeah. uh, update. Yeah, so, you know. so in the beginning will be more, less efficient, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Beginning yeah. Less in the beginning less efficient. efficient. Yeah. As time goes on, the buffer increases yeah. and then it gets better. They have to have it's, you're correct, so there is some... Uh, <laughs> there is some... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sylvia, Sylvia, one Sylvia one. Uh, last comment because we're going to have to go for coffee. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, if you have to go, it doesn't... It doesn't um, oh, I, I just... You know, I wanted to a bit go go back to. I think we also we really need to. I mean, on top of course of uh, what Renato you were saying, right? Of course, funding institution gave uh, you know funds for building J Pass the way it is being conceived. But I think ultimately, practically speaking, they also want scientific return, right? That's what they're going to look at, right? So I think the exercise that we really need to always keep doing is uh, what is the scientific return of every move we do, right? In terms of papers, in terms of visibility, collaboration with other surveys that give a lot of visibility to the project. So I think it's of course data itself, but also how to use the data for the scientific output, right? And yeah. uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Okay. All right. So let's thank everybody. Hi guys, we, we come back at 12.15, so the first speaker is Sandri, she's here too. Very well. I'm, I'm here, I believe I'm the first. Yeah, you're the first at 12.15. Uh, if you want, you can share the screen already. Is it, is it working? We, yeah, we can see it. Uh, try to put it full screen presentation mode. Third one here in So the first year Okay, perfect. You're good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, see you in a while. So okay, see you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the last uh, science day pass session. Uh, this is going to be a short one. We only have three talks. Uh, and the first one is uh, Andres Kovacs, uh, who will speak about cosmic voids in the JPAS survey pro prospects for CMB cost correlation measurements. So you have uh, 12 minutes and uh, you can start. Okay, hopefully you can hear me well. So yes, yes this will be a, okay, fine. Uh, so this will be a brief summary about some activities that uh, we have done in the past year or years at the at the IAC in Tenerife, we, mostly with students, Gisela Camacho and Nestor Arsenov, but with Carlos and the new PhD student, Mark, we are collaborating on different topics related to void science, CMB, and large structure cross-correlations, etc. Uh, and just to introduce the topic itself, which because I think you didn't hear too much about cosmic voids or this kind of science at this meeting. I like to think about this problem as, of course, in the, in the normal way of end-to-end uh, -end models of, of cosmology, connecting the initial conditions, the CMB, to, to today's cosmic web. And if you think about it, today's cosmic web is full of empty space, right? These cosmic voids in between the filaments and clusters and the messy, nonlinear, high-density areas. And one way to sell this void science, right? Is, and also going back a little bit to the discussion in the, in the previous session about, do we want to uh, understand primarily dark energy with this survey or not? I guess one way to do it best is with these cosmic voids, right? Because they are the most dominated by, by dark energy, if you wish, being the, the under dense patches of the cosmic web. So I'll try to motivate further why is this interesting. So the, my personal main interest in, in all this is to understand a particular aspect between these two regimes, like the local, relatively local large structure studies and the early universe CMB kind of constraints, which as probably we all know, are producing these days interesting tensions with the Hubble constant, also with the lensing effect, the clumpiness of the matter distribution. And regarding large scale structures, not with not at the two point function level, but actual structures, right? Including voids or very big super voids. There are two interesting things which happen along the trajectory of the photons, right? So there is a CMB lensing effect. So the photons are defected uh, on their path towards us. And also the integrated Sox-Wolf rise W effect, which is sensitive to the time der derivative of the gravitational potential as due to dark energy, they become shallower. So there are these two slightly different but connected effects which voids can provide a window for. And this is what we, we want to study in the context of the, of the JPAS survey. A little bit of uh, background here about recent results, particularly something which I led in as a member of the dark energy survey. And it's something to, so the main goal here was to measure the CMD lensing uh, signal uh, by stacking 
the Planck maps on the voids uh, identified in the DES uh, Red Magic LRG catalogs, right? And the, 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 the very simple message here is that there is this A kappa amplitude, like the kappa observed signal uh, in this void versus the predicted uh, or simulated lambda CVM one. And you can see that there is this roughly 20% uh, lower than expected signal from the void. And in this busy plot, what you, I want you to appreciate is basically the depending on how you bin your data or you use uh, voids with different size, different central under density, different redshift, or if you extend the analysis to super clusters, points typically scatter at the low end of the value one, which would be the lambda CDM with some Planck-like cosmology. So there is some tension here, but nothing groundbreaking. Uh, and also let me mention that the preliminary analysis of the same thing, so measuring the CMB lensing from voids from the DESI legacy survey, voids and superclusters, is also consistently showing this sort of lower than expected lensing, which is interesting at least. And there are ways, of course, to improve the modeling or the simulation analysis, but also we need more data to understand this better. And among other surveys, JPLAST is of course one of them. And in particular, why this is a, a nice uh, new regime is that, of course, with the typical galaxy surveys, uh, yeah, here I'm plotting some LS predicted LSSD and of Z here with the blue and orange red colors, and also showing where the DS low redshift galaxy catalogs uh, live on this plot on the left, right? And what I want I you want to you look to at is basically <laughs> is this purple curve, like the CMB lensing efficiency or CMB yeah. lensing kernel, which is actually quite low at low redshift, but it has a sort of peak. Uh, it goes to the epoch of the quasar peak activity error, which we are able to, to target with uh, with the nice expected JPS quasar sample. And while, the, of course, the, the density of the tracers is lower, we do expect uh, a nice CMB lensing signal because the CMB lensing efficiency is much better than a lower edge. So this is a, a one motivation. And another thing which could be interesting but probably won't have enough signal to noise is to measure the other component, the ISW signal. But as you can see on the right, it's kind of in opposite phase, right? Because this, the strength of this ISW signal has to do with the linear growth rate of structure, more or less. And here you can see some lambda CDM prediction. So as you go to higher and higher ratchet, of course, this should fade and approach this matter-dominated einstein sitter like high ratchet universe. So there might be less uh, motivation to, to try to measure these signals here because of the lack of the signal to noise. But nevertheless, we, we might attempt to do that as well. OK, something more concrete. Uh, so in order to model all this, possibly, we decided to use this WebSky simulation, which is not a full embodied simulation, uh, but it's based on some approximate methods, but it's very big. It's a uh, full sky. It has a light cone. And most importantly, it has many calculated uh, CMB foreground maps, so, uh, cosmic infrared background as well, KS and effects, um, Compton Y maps for the thermal Sunyev Zadovich effect, and the CMB kappa map, for instance, that we that we want to uh, use for our modeling in this analysis. And one more detail is to, so considering, which, which can always be a problem, right? What if the simulation has enough resolution, redshift range, et cetera. And with this WebSky mock catalog that we used, uh, actually, this is not really a problem because it's on the left, you can see that the minimum halo mass, so the kind of resolution of the simulation is a function of redshift. And you can see that in the range of these QSOs, let's say from one to three to four, we are in this limit of uh, being able to resolve practically all the possible uh, QSO host halos. On the right, you can see uh, an HOD, approximate HOD modeling used by, by the EBOS uh, collaboration in the latest QSO sample. So 10 to the 12 halo mass is more or less this characteristic one, which we can nicely resolve with the simulation. 
so we can attempt to do some sort of modeling. And this part of the analysis was led by, by Nestor. Um, and essentially what he did is to create as a baseline from, from this web sky simulation, an eboss like density of, of quasars, right? And then we gradually improve to something which is more JPAS like. And yeah, you can imagine it in two ways, right? So there on the right, there is the number density of tracers as function of redshift for eboss. And then we just very naively and by hand essentially in, increased the, the density of the quasars and, uh, by 50%. We call this JPAS low density or we doubled it and we call this JPS high density. And uh, on the left, this is a, at a more pictorial level. If you of course want to, are you, if you're interested in finding the voids in the distribution of these quasars at, at high redshift, you care about the, the sampling density, of course. And yeah, to highlight this, yeah, the, the test void with a question mark could be probably identified as a void if you only have uh, EBOS QSO density, so the yellow tracers, but if you have more depth, so more access to, to data, maybe that's not a void after all in, in reality. So this is how we expect kind of naturally to, to improve our, our inference on, on, on the voids and, and every, every related signal. So the logic of the measurement is fairly simple, right? So we find the voids in the, either projected or full 3D catalog of, of these uh, QSO tracers with different void finder methods. This could also be kind of inverted to work with superclusters, et cetera. <clears throat> and then knowing these positions for up to, I don't know, thousands of voids, right? So you do the stacking measurements on the void position. We also do this rescaling to the angular size of the voids. So everything here is in the units of the void radius up to one. Uh, is basically the void itself and then some compensation area with the yellow and orange around it. And yeah, so we correlate the void positions with the simulated CMB temperature or, or lensing measurements. And out of that, we measure some radio profiles. We estimate errors from randomized measurements as basically usual. And then we want to use this measure profiles to test the consistency of, of the cosmological model. And in this first uh, result, which which, I'm, which is basically the ma main result of, of, this, of this presentation is that if you do this exercise, so increase from, the e from an EBOS like density, uh, you can see it on the left panel and the leftmost figure is you stack, you find the voids in an EBOS like density, you stack the CMB lensing on top of them and you end up with a rather pale blue signal. And as you increase, the quasar density to be more JPS like, you naturally gain uh, a little bit more, well, so roughly 25% in the signal to noise uh, due to this better reconstruction of the voids themselves, finding their centers better. And naturally, also, then, then the CMB lensing reconstruction becomes also more accurate, which you can also appreciate from this. Uh, three different profiles, right? With, from going from the EBOS like density in yellow, and then the light blue is J plus low, and the red, which is our best case scenario, doubling the density is J plus high. So there is some robust detection in, in all three cases, but we see a, an improvement, uh, of course, with the increased QSO density. We tried a number of things. Here I'm just highlighting a particular one. If you look at this purple, uh, measurement with uh, increased error bars and the lower signal amplitude. This is based on uh, our approach to try to push this whole exercise to even larger redshifts between 2.2 and 2.8 in redshift. And you can see that the signal to noise for that particular sample alone is just 2.8, but we still gain a little bit in signal to noise if we combine it with the red measurement, which was our best case scenario for this nominal EBOS like redshift window from 0.8 to 2.2. So this is also showing that uh, this is a delicate measurement, right? Because it's easy to run out of uh, sampling density and then the void reconstruction becomes very inefficient. So not, not ideal. And basically to, 
uh, wrap this up and conclude, basically I can just tell you that now we are thinking about or likely working on a more advanced uh, web sky QSO mock catalog based on some more proper luminosity function based measurements instead of just by hand changing the N of Z. And we are testing with other void finders. We have the capacity also and, uh, and the interest to work with galaxies, not just QSOs in this mock, other mocks, and also to create multiple mocks with CMB lensing or ISW maps with this uh, new Colora approach or other approximate methodologies. And importantly, I'm also involved in the beef QSO analysis because there are possible synergies by pushing this problem to even higher redshift and to use this Lyman Alpha Forest to map out uh, cosmic voids at even higher redshift and to attempt to do uh, even more tomography, right? And to sum up and give you some take-home messages, I think in the particular case of, of the CMB cross-correlation measurements and pretty much in general, cosmic voids uh, to be observed by, uh, by JPEGs are very nice and highly complementary tools to access cosmological information beyond the two point function, if you wish. And I want to highlight again the great contributions both by, by Nestor in, in, and Gisela in all these analysis, uh, based on which it seems possible that uh, high signal to noise TMB cross correlation measurements Will, will be possible in, in the coming years. And I, I hope to uh, participate actively in, in actually getting the data, testing the catalogs. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity to present these results to you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. So we may have time for a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Andras. Uh, How Abramo here. Thanks for very interesting uh, new ideas there for JPAS. Can you uh, about these marks? They seem extremely useful. Uh, you you have done a significantly more thorough job than we did at some point. Can I look at your number of quasars compared with the boss uh, and the low? JPAS QSO, high JPAS QSO, there was a slide about that. Yeah, that's one. All right, so in this, in this plot here, um, are you showing the luminosity function somewhere? Is it the web sky blue line in some sense? Or I don't, I don't understand exactly what are the density corrections that you are using there. No, at the density, without density correction, the blue line is some sort of nominal um, E plus H of the best parameter based curve because they don't actually do the H of the in a light cone but in a box. So, as a function of redshift, the actual H of the should change. So, we had to kind of subsample that to, to match the, the E boss or the, or the J pass like uh, curves. So, and luminosity functions are not really involved yet in, in all this. This is the, the next step actually to, to do. This is just basically just changing the QSO activation tau and activate more quasars with the same HOV to end up with a higher density, but this is to be explored and optimized. Okay, so you haven't really normalized in a fine way with the luminosity function. Uh, okay, because uh, I, I, I have the feeling, I don't know, Carolina, you can correct me. I have the feeling that those numbers might be yeah, you might you might update them a bit, maybe not by much, but uh, maybe they will go up a bit. Uh, we will anyway. We can talk, but anyway, it's it, it's uh, very interesting. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So we should move to the next. Uh, we can. Uh... Thank you. Gombo, uh, can you share your screen? Yeah. So. Uh, mm. Okay, full screen. Okay, perfect. So the next talk is by Gomu Tsao about cosmological implications of large galaxy surveys. So you can start and you have 12 minutes, please. Well, thank you. It's my great pleasure to uh, give this presentation. Um, so this is basically the lesson I learned from the EBOS um, survey. Um, 
So we know the universe is accelerating, but we don't know why. In principle, there are two ways to get this acceleration. You can either have dark energy as the modification of the Einstein equation on the right-hand side, or instead you can modify the uh, gravity and that's the left-hand side modification to the GR uh, equation. So uh, background level, these two scenarios can be uh, perfectly degenerate, but, um, but at the perturbation level, uh, you can see the difference. That's why uh, the galaxy service is super useful to break this dark degeneracy. So this is a snapshot of the ball survey. Each dot is a galaxy. We've taken about uh, 1 million uh, spectra from balls. Uh, so we just take these three coordinates in, uh, in redshift space and create a three-dimensional clustering map. Um, so this is how the EBOS spectra look like. Uh, we have blue galaxies, red galaxies, and quasars. Um, they look like this. So now if we look at the galaxy clustering on super large scales, now we use BAO as a probe. That's a probe for dark energy at the background level. If we look at the clustering in the, in the intermediate scale, that's we're looking at the perturbation, that's redshift space distortions. That's a natural probe for gravity. If we look at the small scale clustering, we can measure the neutrino masses, of course, it's an important topic. And uh, in the past few years, I've been very much involved in EPOS, we've taken 1 million spectra in this redshift range. Now we are doing this in PFS. Of course, we are having JPAS, which, uh, which has a very uh, much higher density than PFS and DESI, the super complementary. Now, this is basically the pipeline where we take the data, we run statistics, and we extract interesting cosmological parameters. Um, so in 2020, we released uh, a bunch of papers. So with a catchy title, we don't need to mind the gap because we had already filled the gap using the EBOS survey during the shift 0.6 to 2.2. So we successfully measured the BAO using different traces. Now we published two blue papers using blue galaxies, two red papers using red galaxies, and myself, uh, is my colleague, we cross correlating uh, the red and blue, so that's green. We published two green papers and supplemented by the Quiza and Big Cosmology paper. So this is the, the nice plot. Um, actually, it's my favorite. We got the BAO from different uh, type of traces at different redshifts. Oh. So the interesting thing is, this is the footprint of the EBOS. Now we see that the blue and red galaxies, they overlap in both redshift and footprint, so we can cross correlate the two. So this is the BAO from the red galaxy. You see this ring very well. And we also measured the RSD from the, the LRDs very well. So the blue galaxy isn't that good because we don't have many of those uh, the covering a small part of the sky. Uh, we spend a lot of time to identify the systematics and we think that we have already uh, mitigate these uh, known observational systematics. We believe that with, uh, with PFS and that we can do much better for the systematics for the, for the ELG. We didn't do very well for the BAO detection from the ELG yes, because of the systematics. And quiz, we did very well for the quizzes because they're very bright, um, it's much easier to do. Then, then, then the blue galaxies, uh, you see this BAO peak is very clear. And this is the, the uh, cross correlation analysis between red and blue. And this is the overlapping uh, in, in redshift direction. So why the cross correlation is useful? Because uh, with only one tracer, whatever you do, uh, no matter how high you, your density is, you, you're subject to the cosmic variance because there are a uh, finite number of pairs on large scales. But if you have two tracers, in principle, you can uh, compare the two tracers 
on large scales, that's uh, you can cancel out the cosmic variance. You're measuring this ratio, which is uh, um, the cosmology we want. Uh, this is RSD. This is the idea. Now we applied this idea to the uh, EBOS survey. And this is the measurement uh, of power spectrum with the red and blue and red cross blue. You see the band is from the MOX. You see for the blue galaxies, there are sort of outliers from the data that might be a, a sign of systematics. But uh, for the cross correlation, it's, uh, of course it has a much larger error bar, but uh, it's well within the, uh, the, the band. So the reason is that if there is systematics for the red and different systematics for the blue, we believe that their systematics, they shouldn't correlate. So the cross correlation is a much cleaner signal measure. Right, so this is the cross power spectrum. You see the elongated uh, feature along this parallel, K parallel. That's the RSD. Now we detect these RSD at uh, like four sigma level. Now we reconstruct this uh, evolution of the universe, uh, the background and the perturbation from, from this BR16 in EBOS sample. Um, cosmologically, that means that the, there is omega dark energy at 11 sigma level from the BAO alone. That's a very strong, robust uh, measurement, uh, which is independent from the supernova. And uh, we also reconstructed the dark energy equation of state. So in 2017, that was the old data from BOSS. Now in 2020, we just compare this prediction from the 2017 data to the EBOSS measurement. They're sort of consistent within the error bar. We try to uh, confirm this feature, W isn't minus one using um, DESI, PFS, and JFAS measurements. So this is the new idea we just proposed earlier this year. So uh, that involves reconstruction. So this is a pre-reconstructed density field. Now, when we use the phase information, we can reconstruct this, this data, this, this uh, density field, which is uh, much more linear and Gaussian. Um, so then you take the measurements of the power spectrum from pre, P pre, you cannot get P post. That means these two are uh, complementary. Of course, you can cross correlate the two. And uh, in theory, so basically means uh, the cross correlate, I mean, the post recon field has a, con a contribution from the high order statistics. Then when you combine this post recon with the pre recon, you are sort of using this different, the two point functions, three point and four, fun four point functions separately. That's why you can uh, have an information gain uh, from the field. So we run this analysis using uh, uh, embody simulations and we indeed see the gain. And you see there is a decorrelation between print post and small scales. And when we combine the two, they, we see that they're highly complementary for the BAO and RSD parameters. We see these this contours, they kind of, they have different orientations uh, from, from different spectra. And we also did analysis using all on this Quixote simulation, which is a galaxy mark at redshift zero. Um, so I skipped the details, but uh, this is the result. Uh, again, we see a very clear decorrelation between pre and post. And uh, this is the um, correlation matrix between the power spectrum and bias spectrum, actually. We see that the, the post recon power spectrum isn't correlated with the bias spectrum. That means they're highly complementary, but the pre has a strong correlation with the B naught. That means the pre recon has the information from the three point, but the post recon is dominated by the two point. So when you combine the two, there is additional information. 
So you see, this is the constraint on the HOD and the sigma eight parameter. Um, there is a big gain when you combine everything from the two point. We can even win against this two point, this traditional analysis using the two point and, and a three point, um, which is um, very useful. And this is much easier to measure. So this is the information on different parameters. So the bars, so the vertical line means that the, the measurements, the information uh, using uh, measured from the pre plus the bias spectrum. So in many cases, we can even win against that, that traditional analysis using two point only. So this is my last few slides. So we, also did a reconstruction of dark energy and modified gravity simultaneously. So this is Newton gauge metric. So we modify the Poisson equation and the gravitational slip equation using this mu and sigma uh, functions, uh, also the dark energy uh, density, effective dark energy density. Um, this is a non parametric reconstruction. So we need some prior from theory now we perform simulations using uh, the most general Hollandeski model. And we got uh, the cross correlation measurements from the monks. Then we use this as a prior, uh, as an input, then we reconstruct uh, uh, those functions simultaneously. You see on the left, this is the raw reconstruction without any prior, it's a bit noisy. But interestingly, you see some dynamics in dark energy, which is not constant. We see some deviation of the mu, which is effective Newton constant. We see some interesting feature in the sigma function, which measures the gravitational lensing potential. Now, when we put in this theory prior, things become more smooth, but some interesting features still are still there. Now we have to wait uh, for the CTFS and JPAS to confirm this. And uh, we also comment on this uh, Hubble tension and sigma tension uh, from our reconstruction. It's sort of helpful, but not enough to, to resolve the tension. I think I will stop here and uh, take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. So we have time for one or, yeah, Carlos. Um, Gumbo, here uh, Carlos speaking. I have one question regarding the construction. Uh, you say that you have the post-reconstruction spectrum, the pre-reconstruction spe spectrum, and the cross-correlation between the two. Right. And that you, you know, and that uh, you actually uh, gain some information while doing this, while doing this is a construction of the, the density field. That's right. But, uh, uh, this reconstruction assumes some fiducial cosmology, and uh, to what extent this assumption actually is involved in the in the in the estimation of cosmological parameters that you deduce from from this analysis? Uh, yeah, it's a good, good question. Uh, is it true that we need to know the bias and the linear growth rate for the reconstruction, but it is not not biased because in the modeling we can take we can fold this in. So whatever B and F you're using for the reconstruction, it doesn't affect the final re result. Uh, we tried this, we tried using a very wrong B and F and uh, we got the right answer. Um, that's not the issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one more short question. So very quick question uh, related to that. Uh, hi, this is Hawa Bramo here. I, I wonder um, to what extent this, um, uh, this this analysis of the reconstruction with respect to by spectrum is is complementary to using effective field theory and uh, bias expansion and so on. It seems that they are. I mean, they are. They must be complementary in a very deep sense, right? Can you comment on that? Yeah. So in terms of the modeling, we believe that uh, in the framework of the EFT. So it's still complementary, but in this analysis, we uh, we didn't use any model. It's basically pure numeric derivatives. Thing. So we, so that we can go to very small scales, and I believe that with EFT large scale structure, we can still get the information gain. But 
perhaps we cannot go to very small scales, like uh, 0.3 or so. Uh, we, are, we are trying this. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again, the speaker. Thank you. Uh, okay, and the last speaker here uh, in the room is uh, Pablo Amaltemu, uh, who will speak about the past uh, galaxy mocks for large scale structure studies. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the, my idea today was to. Uh, Tell you about the, the work we've been doing at the NSS working group, uh, preparing the galaxy mocks we need, basic mainly for the NSS and the theory groups, but that may be useful for for more people in the in the collaboration. And again, as Andres uh, said yesterday, probably we don't need to explain much about why we need those those mocks, uh, but basically the, the idea is that we need a. a set of linearization of the of something that looks like the like the j pass uh, survey at uh, at least at the largest scales but also hopefully at the at the scales of the of the halos for this we cannot do full embodied simulation so we'll be uh, doing this in two steps the first one is to generate uh in some fast way a set of of halo mocks and then populate them with with galaxies using the the Halo occupation distribution, the HLB approach. Uh, and just to remind you that this is something that is pretty much work in progress. There are many things are still that we are still figuring out. Any suggestions is welcome, so please do that. And as I said, the first part uh, is uh, generating a set of uh, Halo mocks that was done mainly by, by Tiago Castro some time ago. And basically, what uh, what the, the what we use the the Pinocchio code, which is a a fast way of generating uh, halo mocks, which is still mm, has acceptable precision. So it reproduces the uh, mass function and the bias of the halos to a, a few percent level. So it's a good thing. And uh, what we have now is a set of one thousand mocks like that uh, that go down to recipe one. Uh, cover an area of 6,000 6, square degrees. This is the area we have compared to some random version of the j uh, footprint. And uh, it's basically, uh, we know we know how to model the halo mass function and the, and the bias function that we have here for those things. Now, now the next step is how to populate those with, with galaxies. And for this, we use this HOD approach, which Basically, the idea here is that for a given galaxy sample, you model uh, what's the ratio. So basically, what's the expected number of central galaxies and satellite galaxies in a halo of a given mass? You uh, basically parameterize it in some way. We use the parameterization of SEN 2005 in a simplified way. Uh, way. So we have three, um, three, three parameters. And the idea here is that this gives you a way of populating your halo with galaxies, but also if you fix that model, you know what the two-bit correlation function should be and what the number density of your sample should be. So you can use this to fit real data and also to generate your, your model. And then once you have that, it's basically a simple idea. You have your mock distribution, sorry, your halo distribution. You populate it with uh, galaxies following this this recipe. If you have you are above a certain halo mass uh, threshold, you put a, a central galaxy at the a, a central galaxy at the center, and then you uh, assign a number of satellites to each halo following a Poisson distribution based on this on this on this average we had, and then you put it on the on your position in, in your halo just following the, the real global. And as well, uh, you only you can also uh, assign velocities to those clear velocities to those galaxies based on the velocities of the halos and the just the virial, uh, velocities inside that. So you can also uh, uh, not just put the real positions of the, the real position of the of the galaxies, but also the 
relative space position of the phase. So what you will assume from the observed relative. And this is what you do for a given sample. Now, uh, what we want to do is also to do this as function at least of luminosity or stellar mass or some properties of the galaxies. And for this, basically, what we, we are using this, this hot pie code from Smith and collaborators, which basically what, what you need here is to have those, those parameters that define your, your relation between the halo and the galaxies as function of some uh, galaxy property, typically the, the luminosity. And once you have that, you can generate those, those galaxies there, but and also assign them a luminosity in a way that reproduces the clustering and the, and the luminosity function. And we also, I won't mention this a lot, but you can also basically model the color distribution in your sample and then use that to assign a color to, the, to your galaxies. So what we did here was to uh, basically try to do that, use that method to populate our, our halo uh, mocks and to define what the uh, HOD distribution would be, what those HOD parameters are. We went to the mini JPAS data because the idea is that we do this here with mini JPAS data, we'll do it later with JPAS data to have a, 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 a mock catalog that actually reproduces what we, we get in, in our data. And for this, uh, basically, we got uh, several defined several samples uh, at pressure around 0.4, selected in in I1 absolute uh, magnitude using the the estimation of the of the for the uh, for the luminosities from the from the galaxy evolution group that from Luis Dia. And from that, uh, we basically can get those uh, different parameters, M1, M, M min, M1, alpha, as function of, of luminosity. And I note here that we are, I chose the, the range of the, of the luminosity here on purpose, because basically there's, we are fitting this with some smart function, that is what we observe in, in other surveys, but we are really extrapolating here uh, somehow, because at the right end, we cannot really measure clustering in, in mini JPAS. So we, we, also, we do look at the luminosity function at, at the right end, and that basically fixes the M mean, but the other two parameters are basically unreasonable extrapolation, but that's, but that's it. And uh, also, this do this as function of luminosity, and then we also get the evolution of those HOD parameters of that relation between halos and galaxies as function of redshift, and we do this just from the evolution of the of the luminosity function, because that already fixes what you would, what you would get. And uh, okay, I don't mention here, but in the same way, we are modeling also the color magnitude uh, relation in mini JPAS because that's what we want to to put it also in, in our in our models. So once we do that, we get those parameters uh, that we are that we know that match uh, mini JPAS. We go to our Halo catalog and put galaxies in there following this this recipe. For now, we've done it with just one realization because we are uh, basically testing things, and we are comparing this to a, a magnitude limit of 22.5 in R1 in the detection band, which is basically what we de uh, designed the Halo the Pinocchio Halo MOX for. And uh, so I show here some results in which we are comparing the what we get in the MOX to what we get in, in mini JPAS. Here is a plot of Reci versus uh, luminosity. In gray, we have the MOX, and the color points are the mini JPAS uh, points. Yes, to mention here that this orange line following here is basically the limit on the central galaxies that we get from the halo mass limit we have in Pinocchio, which means that basically this uh, Brighton here at low relative is uh, a way that we, we are not really uh, sampling it well because we are not uh, having uh, the less massive, uh, sorry, no, it's not the Brighton, it's the Fainton. At, the, at uh, low relative, we, we don't have halos with such a small mass, so we basically cannot trust anything there. But for most of the interesting part, we are actually uh, following in this well, uh, and I'm just showing some some plots of the number density uh, as function of redshift. We basically recover what we have in mini JPAS, and also as function of luminosity cut for the for the uh, redshift beams, and we are within the errors or within a reasonable uh, tolerance 
uh, recovering them. Uh, and also uh, the important part, which is uh, how the clustering looks like, we compare this uh, in three recipients, different uh, luminosity cuts. Here the, again, the lines are what we get from the from this mod. The points with the error bars are what we get from the mini J pass. And well, basically, we are getting the relative evolution and the and the luminosity uh, evolution of the of the clustering with its seems that it's with reasonable agreement, given that the many j has large errors and probably the errors shown here are, are actually underestimated. Thanks. Uh, and there's uh, some issues here with the one halo term that we have to, to look into. Uh, again, uh, we also get the, the magnet, uh, color magnitude relations uh, uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable agreement here. Uh, and just did also a quick test on how the, that recipe space thing uh, work. This is the clustering for, for a given sample. In this is the 2D correlation in along the line of sight and, and the, in the orthogonal direction. And we have when we calculate it in recipe space, we get the, the distortion that we expect. Um, so now the part that we are or the crucial part that we are missing here, and we, this is something we've been discussing this week on how to do that actually, is uh, how to actually assign a photometric recipe to the galaxies we have in the mod. Because we have, uh, we have the, the basic properties, but we have to simulate how the photo sets work. And I think we've decided that the first approximation we'll do here is uh, basically, given the properties we have, the magnitude, color, relative of the galaxies in the mod, we'll assign some odd value, basically sampling from mini j pass data. This is so it will be sampling from this plot with a third dimension that will be the, the color. We have relative and, and magnitudes here. And basically, from the odds uh, and the, all the work that the Photoshop people have done, you can assign a probability of being an outlier and a probability of having some uh, thing in your in your in your photo set if it's not an outlier and again from that you can sample that distribution and get a, an estimate that you can you can put in your mode. this is a first approximation uh, then you probably want to go at some point you may want to go farther away either generating the in a similar way a, a pd set or, or pdf of the recipe distribution for each galaxy or also, especially for uh, the part, uh, the part where we want to study how the uh, systematics that has affect different different areas in the survey are actually affecting the, the photoset quality. For that, we may need to actually uh, generate a J spectra for each of those of those galaxies and then work with that. But that's for now. It's it's not what what we are doing. That will be sometimes somewhere in the future. And uh, I think that was basically what I did, wanted to tell you. The main idea is that we think we are at the point that we can generate those uh, mobs and reproduce the basic properties of, of what we have in mini JPAS, but covering a much larger scale. Those uh, we plan to implement that, those simple photo set uh, part uh, soon, have those mobs available to the collaboration. And obviously we'll then uh, also improve this when we have some more data to calibrate. And also, as, as Andres mentioned in his talk yesterday, we have a different set of halo mocks from, the, from their BAM model that we can do the same exercise and get a different uh, set of galaxy mocks to, to, to work with. And of course, uh, this is done to be useful for the, as many people as possible in the collaboration. So if you think you, you could this could be useful for, for you. Please get in touch and, and that's it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So we have time for questions, Jeff. Yeah, you go back to slide number eight, I believe. Eight. Eight? Uh, seven. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the mismatch in the one halo term, it's not a prediction. Yeah. I assume the prediction comes from a uh, perical symmetric NFW. Yes. 
but the real clusters in the data, so in many other surveys, are not spherical, they're elongated. Yeah. So that electricity may introduce a deviation from the NW5. That yes. That alone may explain the mismatch. Um, so, okay. So before that, uh, there are other things I want to, to test because I'm not sure. Basically, the relation between the concentration of the ma and the mass right. we are putting it, I'm not right. completely sure about it, so we we'll have to, to check that. And then uh, uh, that would be good to check also the electricity. Uh, honestly, with the Pinocchio, we don't really have that uh, electricity. Some electricity for the for the halos in normal. So, but when you when you um, paint the galaxies, yeah, yeah, you, you can put it by hand, but it's uh, but right, but you have to some 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 distribution. You could either do that, or uh, that's something I will have to ask Andres because I know in the in the in the BAM uh, method they are actually generating more properties for the for each of the halos. So I, I would like to check whether there's something that is. That they are generating so we can improve with their with their model. Okay. And I that's all. Um, I, I don't think that this is going to be mentioned properly. And um, I was wondering what is the width, um, what is the spread over the halo that you put? I mean it's it's not like the mean mass, but it's the is the like this you know scatter or the distribution in mass that is important and typically it's underestimated we have a paper on that you can actually use the number we, we uh, use there um it, it is more important because it may help with the um with re reproduction of the so but basically i mean if the standard thing is to play with the satellite fraction uh, in order to fix uh, the one hell term for a fixed uh, hell term i mean this is the standard thing uh, you can you can do that this way, or you can you can play with this uh, width of the of the distribution of the halos to do yeah. that, and that's that's a standard practice. Mm -hmm. And um, what we show this is uh, when you when you invert things, when you look at you know uh, what is the population of galaxies in hell in a, a group, so you actually see the difference, which is due to this width. Uh, because you get this. So, so the, the, the width of what? Yeah, so so like if, a, if you say I put the galaxy in the halo, yeah. you should spread it over the halos. You're not, you should not put it in a single halo, you should spread it. You should say a typical um, delta M over M that you should use is like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Yeah, uh, the, sorry, I, the, so the, like the distribution of, of yeah. so you should put like each in the, in, the, in, the, in the mass, uh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the range of colors. Now, like put the Gaussian uh, centered on your, you know, same halo mass that you're mm -hmm. doing, and then put the Gaussian, and mm -hmm. then the width of the Gaussian is your free parameter. Yeah. Did you change to to get the, this one halo term? Uh, yeah. So I think it's. Uh, I, I let me know if I understand. Is it? So I understand this is this this <laughs> sigma here that they change the. The, the relation between the the oh, I mean oh, well that's for center so I think that, you mean that's, for that's yeah that, well this is like a combine how many galaxies you have per per uh, okay, per okay. Gal, okay? Yeah. and then that's a cut um, but then it's because the end what what is important for you is is um, you take a galaxy of of a given let's say absolute magnitude. And, and start redistributing it over the handle masses. That's, yeah. that's a different plot for that one. So, yeah, okay. So this, how, how these things are going to But I was, okay, so practical question is um, you plan to use absolute uh, magnitude? Sorry? You plan to use absolute magnitude in R for, for the clustering? Uh, so actually, that's something we have to think about. We could either do it with absolute magnitude, or we can do it with the stellar mass if we have some some good estimates of the, of the stellar mass. Right. Okay, so um, you are using a product of uh, Galaxy Evolution Group for that. So Rosa, <laughs> what's your guess? How good will be your estimate of the absolute magnitude with uh, just the two trees? Huh? Oh. <laughs> 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 
I don't know if it's connected, but uh, the, he did the exercise to calculate which is the mass, which is in some way is equivalent to to the to the absolute magnitude. Um, and the error is significantly when you use two trays, the the third, the one and the second trays, it is around 0.5 in depth which is <laughs> horror. Yeah. And the problem is that the systematic uh, chain with the, with the rest, which is uh, logic, because um, as soon as we um, go to higher resin, we are sampling a very small uh, uh, range, uh, wavelength range in the, in the, in the optical. Okay. So that means that it, for us, it will be very yeah. difficult even to get the, yeah. the stellar map and the luminosity, which is yeah, a, right. a, a exactly yeah, the same. So I think yeah. if you look at the maps, you should, uh, you okay. know, we okay. to, you should simulate the uh, systematic effect in if you're in your life like, construction okay. tracer that comes from uh, use of uh, tracer, then we know uh, what you actually it doesn't matter, right? For the mocks, as long as we have one thousand square degrees, five hundred square degrees, then we can extrapolate this for all mocks regardless of the area. And then right. you can, yeah, 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 you can. We can do that. We are, Yes, so I'm saying saying you plan to use absolute magnitude. Somebody has to calculate it for you. And if these people tell you we need four trays, you better no, listen. No, no, this, I'm right? not getting I mean, this. No, no, no. This is, this is, that's the only thing I'm, you know. No, I think you're wrong. Piloting. I think you're wrong. You need, uh, you, need, you, need, <laughs> you need to have this for a certain amount of area. You need to find a well defined scaling relation. Unless this works for a one hundred degrees, like we have the other standards, then you start looking for the whole mox for the yeah. whole entire mox. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the, it's right that when you do that, you would need to uh, put in in the same way that I I'm getting a, an error band magnitude, and I will put in an error following what we get in the data. You will put that in the stellar mass or in the luminosity, and and see if that's enough. I and mean, then it will be a matter of testing the the the, code, the algorithms and see. And how, then, how much does that affect? I don't then, know how much. Then the component. Of course, ultimately, Alex is correct. The problem we have to live with the classification that the pass gives us. I'm not sure if it's going to be absolute magnitude. I bet it's not going to be. I bet it's going to be a combination of stellar mass, of color, of some other properties. But that is really the key question. How how well can we do with four trays, with this depth, with that depth, and so on? This is this is really clearly a issue, but. You start, of course, with a mock with perfect <laughs> magnitudes, and then you move on to degrade it in some ways. And then you see what you get in the end, right? But with four trays, with two trays, with more depth and less depth. But the mock is with four trays. Yeah, the mock, the mock itself with, with four trays <laughs> and with sufficient statistics. And once you're there, then you touch your mocks and then you degrade them. But if something plays, it's, it's no, not it's, in this sense. If you live in a mock universe, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Hello, guys. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, can, can I add something? Please. Uh, okay. okay. Only because it's you. <laughs> yes, because I was exactly, I was computing that. I mean, uh, I I have the impact of, of using uh, four trace or, or two trace in order to, to estimate the star masses, a function of resistance and so on. So if you want, I can I can show something very briefly, or as you prefer. Yeah, yeah. sure. The audience uh, <laughs> agrees. <laughs> yes. I think well, why don't you show? Let me just raise another point. The more fun you start, and like it's a oh, galaxy in uh, the spiral. I think you're gonna share <laughs> uh, your whole detection <laughs> limit is gonna change, and uh, so can I share my my screen? Uh, no, no, just not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We are not seeing it. Okay. Okay. Now, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, uh, this is just a, a comparison that uh, I have been doing these days. That just just to see what's the impact of using for uh, two trays instead of, of four trays and uh, these are basically the, the 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 summary of the result so on the left you can see the histograms 
of the uh, stellar masses on the, on the left column and the histograms of the typical uncertainties in the stellar mass when we are using the fortress and using uh, uh, data like my name is okay? And on the right, you can see uh, the same plot, but using two trays instead, okay? So as you can see, as you compare the left columns in, in, in both windows, uh, you can see that the main effect, well, the, the, the effect that everyone is, is expecting is that the uh, uncertainties are going to increase. So for that reason, the distribution of stellar masses are uh, wider. And uh, also we can see that the peak in the distributions uh, in, uh, of the typical uncertainties in the stellar masses uh, move to the right. That means that typically these errors also increase. So you can see that uh, just to, 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 uh, to mention some numbers that the typical uncertainties in the star mass right now using four traces around 0.3 dex, okay? But if we start to use two traces to constrain the same parameter, this uh, number moves uh, from 0.3 to 0.5 and also at both recipe point five, this error increases up to 0.6, 0.7 in the, in the highest recipe beam. And also, in this plot, <clears throat> I'm going to increase the size. Okay. So here also, uh, we are comparing one by one the difference between the, the star masses that we are getting in comparison uh, uh, when we compare using four trays versus two trays. And, and, and the discontinu these dashed lines uh, illustrate the differences in the in the uncertainties of the stellar mass. Okay, that you can uh, you can see that at higher recipes, uncertainties increase with respect to the to the data that we have from mini J pass. But also uh, we find that uh, the typical differences between masses uh, comparing the values that we obtain galaxy by galaxy. Okay. Also, are not uh, are not uh, centered at, at zero. That means that about res, uh, at a uh, recipe higher than 0.5, typically we uh, start to uh, get some uh, systematics in the star masses that we are getting at, with a value about uh, 0.1 dex. Okay. And that's basically the, 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 the summary. And basically, it's, it's, this is replying what you are asking a few minutes ago. Um, I have to add that because uh, it is assuming that the resis is not is equally good. <laughs> so that we have to not include, Luis Carlos included the, the error in the, in the resi. <laughs> Yes, also that's uh, that's right. So here we are assuming that uh, the photo recipe is exactly the same done in mini pass is not changing, and also that um, uh, we, here we are not including the problems with binning. But well, that's another problem. But basically, okay. these are the numbers. <clears throat> okay. Very nice, Luis. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, yeah. So we are done, and that's we. Uh, we'll come back at three o'clock three o'clock okay. all right